Well, we're not paying this. We're not paying. Welcome. Today is Thursday, uh, the 12th of May. Um, this is the school committee. Uh, I'm going to open the meeting and then turn it over to Mr. Thielman um, to, to continue. I'll be at, uh, back at the end. Uh, welcome Siobhan Foley, who is our AEF rep. Um, AEA rep, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, we also have some art today. So uh, from the Thompson and Stratton schools, from Deborah Campagna and Melody Wolf Thomas are the art teachers there. Uh, over to the left here, uh, fifth grade has a contour line shore drawings uh, with Sharpie and marker. Contour line drawings in art only show the outermost edge of the important inner shapes of any given form or object. For this project, students were challenged to draw at least three shoes. Carefully observing each shoe, students captured the outlines and some of the details. When students finished drawing, they painted the shoes in complementary colors using watercolor markers. Uh, one over is a first grade, uh, still life with apples, uh, oil, pastel, and watercolor. First graders discussed the work of artist Paul Cezanne and responded by creating their own still life paintings. Students observed that Cezanne used many colors to create a red or yellow apple. They observed fruit, noticing the apples are not only red, but many colors. When creating their paintings, they also practiced creating the illusion of roundness on a flat surface. Uh, in the back there is the third grade uh, can heads, aluminum cans, acrylic paint, oil pastel, and puffy paint. Uh, Didier Triglier is a contemporary French artist who finds inspiration in found objects. He is a self-taught artist whose work is populated by interesting characters, vibrant colors, and playful lines. Although he works in a wide variety of media, we can found his inspiration in his Canets, a series of painted can heads. Third grade students watched a video of Triglier's work in a studio. They observed how he uses line and texture in his work, frequently outlining and adding dots of raised paint to the edges of the figures. Each week, students added layers of paint to their own cans, and new characters emerged as students worked. Uh, over here to the right uh, is the kindergarten uh, called Beautiful Oops. <laughs> kindergarten students read the book Beautiful Oops by Barney Salzberg to see how mistakes can turn to opportunities. Kindergartners get a thrill out of seeing how Mr. Salzberg made his mistakes beautiful. To make their own beautiful oops, students start by going through their, our scrap box for tre treasures. Once they found a few pieces that appealed to them, they glued them down and added drawings with a crayon. They then used paint to add even more color. Finally, they shared the story of their beautiful oops. And over here to the right is a fourth grade of art weavings with construction paper. Students discuss the word of op, artist, and respond to the art of Bridget Riley by creating their own optical illusions. This was accomplished by weaving paper and altering the warp and the weft of the weavings. Uh, thank you. It's always great to see the beautiful artwork that our students are doing. Uh, do we have public participation? We're, okay. No. All right. So, um, so moving on to the school committee public hearing on school choice. There's nobody. There's nobody. There's no one here to talk, right? Oh. You have to open. Oh, it. sorry. Um, so I was told Dr. Chesson might be able to talk to school choice. Is that? Um, each year, the school committee has to make um, a, a decision as to whether we will, Arlington will be open for school choice or not. Um, school choice is the uh, uh, arrangement in the state of Massachusetts where a district can make the decision to um, open for enrollment from students from outside the district based on space um, availability. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, Arlington has not voted for school choice due to the fact that we are oh. thirsty. <laughs> okay, so the, the school committee so needs to vote as to- I will entertain a motion. Do we have a motion about school choice? I, 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 oh, oh, we do we need, need to be? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I, I move that we uh, reaffirm uh, our policy not to admit non-resident students under the terms and conditions of the inter-district school choice law. Second. second motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Ms. Starks. Uh, any discussion of the motion? Nope, that no room at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. I voted yes as well. So actually, I'm going to now step down and turn the okay. to Mr. Thielman. We'll wish them our best. Back. Yes, yep, I We'll show the athletes our best. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> huh? Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'll mention the, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey is yes, uh, attending to a family event this evening, and so she won't be here. Um, and uh, we'll move forward. The next thing on the agenda is the reappointment of Sharon Grossman to the Human Rights Commission. Does anyone want to speak to this? Do I have a motion? So move. Second, a uh, motion by Mr. Hayner, second by uh, Ms. Starks. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. It passes unanimously. Uh, there is a second candidate uh, for reappointment to the uh, Arlington Human Rights Commission, Christine Carney. We just got the, uh, we need to post that on an agenda. We'll post it on an agenda and we'll talk about this, uh, consider her uh, reapplication on the 24th of, uh, 26th, yep. 26th of uh, May. Okay, um, <clears throat> we're a little ahead of schedule here on the agenda. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm all for moving things, moving things along. So the AHS student representatives update from Day on the Hill. They had to go to the awards. So dinner, they're at the awards they dinner. Could not make it tonight. Well, again, that will get postponed, I guess. That gets postponed. Okay, we reappointed, we reappointed uh, Ms. Grossman. Uh, the health, nursing, and wellness update. They're not here yet. Not so, here yet. all right. We'll be here at seven. Let's go to the monthly uh, report, financial here. report. <laughs> Yay! Awesome. All right, Ms. Johnson, go ahead. Um, we're closing in on it, and our deficit has shrunk. We have also recommended to town meeting that $135,000 be moved into stabilization. Um, so basically, we'll be pulling it out of our reserves and putting it into town reserves. Um, but we felt it was important given the the surplus we are seeing in the special ed out of district tuition line. Mm -hmm. We're showing a, a deficit in special ed transportation. So I consider those two things a wash. And we also have a number of students that are slated for extended evals this spring. And I took those out of it. And so when I figured everything in, left a margin for the unanticipated, I felt like the $135,000 was the fair amount to transfer. Mr. Hanner. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this, may require Ms. Elmer. Uh, why would, uh, do we have a deficit in the uh, transportation? It was something we when out of seen? When out of district kids get added, if they're not going to the same place or they require substantially separate transportation, that can be more expensive. Uh, I, and, I, and, and included in that feature is also homeless transportation. And that's an always unpredictable number. But just clarify, the, the Homeless transportation, we do get it more reimbursement for that than we do. We get it as the town of Arlington. It goes to free cash and is part of the long range plan. It doesn't come back and offset anything in our budget directly. It, indirectly, it does, but not directly. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, we keep moving. District goals, Dr. Bodie is in. Mm -hmm. Well, well, we can. Yes, we can do. What? We can do uh, some of the. Uh, we can do the consent agenda at least and ask for oh, committee yeah, reports. And the committee gonna... reports. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We keep moving. Oh, keep consent moving. agenda. <laughs> All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussions of these items unless a member of the committee so requests. In which event, the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant for approval. Warrant number one six one six three. Total warrant amount. Uh, four hundred and four thousand one hundred four dollars and seventy nine cents dated four twenty eight sixteen approval of draft minutes regular school committee meeting april twenty eighth two thousand and sixteen and school committee school enrollment task force meeting joint minutes approval of the e nelson blake book award for its annual award given to the top ten students with the highest gpa the recipients will not be aware of this award until tuesday june second two thousand and sixteen when the presentation will be made at an awards night by the chair of the arlington school committee do I have a so moved? A second, second. Mo a motion by Mr. Slickman, second by Ms. Starks. Mr. Cardin, were you he you were here on the twenty? You were not here on the twenty eighth. I was here. You, you were was here. here. Yes. Okay, you there were. There was one before that. There was one yes. before that. Okay, got it. Just checking. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. It passes unanimously. Okay, subcommittee reports. Dr. Allison Ampey is not here. Does anyone want to speak to the budget subcommittee? No. Community relations. We are going to have a meeting on Tuesday, May 31st. Uh, we're just firming up the time of that. Um, and on that agenda are um, three things. We are gonna look at the dashboard, we are gonna look at the calendar survey, 
and we are going to look at uh, the initial planning for any fall community forums. So just those three things. Um, so again, Tuesday, May 31st, we will uh, find a time. Okay. District Accountability Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, the subcommittee is allergic to meeting during town meeting season. <laughs> uh, but uh, <clears throat> we will uh, pick up our uh, agenda once town meeting concludes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a thought that uh, if we had the normal uh, agenda, but we're going to go back to it on the goals and stuff, mm -hmm. my understanding is that the goals when we, my discussion will be deferred to the accountability. Mm -hmm. So you may want to consider having a meeting uh, in just so that the goals process. Oh, yeah, I know we, we, we need to do that. But I think that, uh, you know, once we get town meeting settled, we should be done on Monday night. So, uh, you know, the pressure will be off. Okay. Oh, yeah, they'll finish on Monday. Right. There's not much left. We, we all want to finish on Monday. I have an MASC meeting on Wednesday, so they better not extend that. That's right. Facilities, no report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Hainer. There is a do doodle in action uh, to set up an organizational meeting as soon as possible. We will be reporting back to the next meeting. Uh, uh, the initial policies we will be starting on. Uh, School enrollment task force, we're going to talk about that later on. So. I am feeling uh, Warrant committee, Mr. Hainer. Uh, everyone get paid. Any liaison reports or announcements? Um, I attended the permanent town building committee in uh, Bill's absence uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so they're moving forward with, with everything actually, but uh, just some quick <laughs> updates. Uh, the Thompson modulars have been procured. It's actually going to be four classrooms, four small classrooms that are going in. Um, so that will create additional flexibility there. Um, they are interviewing the architects for the addition this week, and I believe we'll be selecting one next week. Um, everything is proceeding at Stratton pretty well. Uh, no major issues there. Thank you very much. Oh, and, and, uh, and as announced at town meeting, the Stratton project is, is well under budget um, by at least a million. So that's great, news. great job. Just want to add, I drove by Stratton today, the two modular units that got stuck uh, the other night, I have arrived and they're on site. <laughs> they got stuck? They, got stuck they were having where? trouble making a turn. Oh, yeah, they traffic for, um, I, I heard from Chief Jefferson yes. that <laughs> one of the nights of town meeting <clears throat> blocked traffic for, on Summer Street for several hours. Oh. There was, a, there was a problem with one of the trucks transporting the modular. The modular was okay, but the truck freaked out. So. <laughs> well, were they trying to make a tight turn or go up the hill? I have yeah, no more details. Left on Washington Street. But it did, it did block traffic for Oh, left on Washington will do it, yeah. yeah. They have a procedure now, so that should relieve it. Uh, I, if I may, yeah. I'd just like to uh, announce to the community that, uh, and I mentioned it the other night, the uh, uh, Memorial Day uh, event will be on May 30th. It will not have, we will not have a parade this year. The event will be a program at the town hall. Uh, there will be a presentation and followed up with a dedication to the last Veterans Memorial Site at Mount Pleasant for, uh, those uh, citizens that have perished in the war on terrorism from 1990 going forward. All are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Hainer, I have an email here on this doodle, but I don't have a link. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. It worked for me. It says, William Hainer, doodle, please respond. All right. Okay. okay. We'll, talk. Uh, we'll took, figure it out. We took care of the committee reports. We took care of the consent agenda. Uh, we want to take care of the EDCO collaborative agreement? Yeah. Sure. Anybody have any questions? Okay. About the superintendent? Well, I don't think it's very controversial. All we're doing is getting rid of Wellesley. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Mr. No, Slickman? That's all we're doing. <laughs> Wellesley? Who needs Wellesley? <laughs> nah, it's superfluous. You, you know? want to explain what's going on? Why should you, you, you're familiar with the agreement? Well, basically, what's, the amendment is to. Uh, that uh, Wellesley has decided to exit the Ed EDCO collaborative, so the agreement is being uh, edited to uh, uh, remove Wellesley and uh, slightly adjust the uh, reporting times for people who want to leave. And you want to explain what the EDCO collaborative is, maybe for the viewers? <clears throat> EDCO collaborative is a joint collaborative we're on for basically special ed and other educational services that are better, to, better and cheaper uh, if they're provided in, uh, for multiple districts. Okay. So, and they also offer uh, forums for school committee members. Uh, I'm our, the, lia the liaison. There's a meeting next Wednesday. 
I find them very informative because a group of uh, school committee members from the entire collaborative get together. The last one we shared with uh, was uh, early starting times mm -hmm. and uh, going forward with that. And it seems to be a very informative. I'll have a report next meeting. Yeah, they do a lot of great um, teacher professional development too, I have to add. Um, you know, they do a lot of things uh, for teachers over the summer and during the course of the year. Um, so, and you get a really uh, great discount and you get first dibs on those classes as a member of the EDCO Collaborative. So um, I think, you know, because I know Lexington is part of that too. So um, it's, uh, I just think it's a great way for, you know, a bunch of schools to think about working together you know, in ways that, you know, can help us save money and, and you know, share ideas. So great. it's really good. Thank you for filling the time there on this topic. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> trying. We're trying. We're trying. doing a great job helping us out. Mr. Hainer, you got anything else? I was just going to suggest possible uh, uh, move. Yeah, motion. Motion. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Hainer, do you want to make the motion? Move to uh, accept the uh, recommendation. Uh, to approve the EDCO Collaborative Articles of Agreement dated 5-19-2016 as amended by a vote of the EDCO Collaborative Board of Directors on April 28, 2016. A motion by Mr. Hainer, a second by Mr. Schlickman. All, any, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, Aye. if that's like unanimous. There's well. a second motion, Mr. Hainer, you want to read uh, that? Recommend uh, mm -hmm. that the collaborative agreement shall not be effective until approved by the member districts as indicated on the signatory page and the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. This agreement is authorized by a vote of each of the member districts and signed by the chairperson of each member district. Move to approve Jennifer Seuss to sign such agreement. May I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Starks, motion by Mr. Hainer, any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, it passes unanimously. Okay, so where's the superintendent? <laughs> <laughs> She's at the dinner. She's at the dinner too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she said she'd be back at 7.30. Okay. Why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> any mischief we can do? Well, I know, uh, we must be able to get into some kind of trouble. Well, we're, we're, we're moving here. Um, it was a lot more fun when we were in the selectmen's chambers. It we was. Could have, it we was. could have made some one-way streets. Uh, well, well. Um, I don't know. She has to speak. Happy to speak. So in the, in the uh, nursing? I mean, her, her recommendation is in writing, but we can't <clears throat> ask her any questions. But, you know, I mean... I mean, my questions about that are for the committee, you, not necessarily. For do you want to move into a quick executive session? To we don't have anything. Nothing. Oh, right. <laughs> Look at us. There's nothing on executive Maybe session. Maybe we should text her. She should come back. Like, sorry, you have to come back. <clears throat> okay. Uh, 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 motion for a brief recess. Uh, there's a motion on the table for Mr. Schlickman for a brief recess. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. It passes unanimously. So we're going to take a quick break until uh, somebody, somebody shows up. Thank you. She'll probably be the first. <laughs> okay, we're back. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to just. Um, one of the things I we meant to read at the, at the start of the meeting was an article uh, in the Arlington Advocate, November 22nd of all dates, huh? November 22nd, 1962. Wow. November 22nd, 1962. That's before I was born. Thank I just you. want to put it out there. Right. Okay. Don't touch me. <laughs> me too. Uh, me too. Yeah, right. Enrollment of, pub of pupils continues its climb. The public school enrollments are continuing to climb upward at an alarming rate. First sentence, first paragraph of the article. <laughs> Since school opened this September, there has been an increase of 235 pupils. Latest figures indicate that the pres present public school population as of October 26th is 8,368 students, or an increase of nearly 500 from a year ago. Of the new pupils, 203 are at the senior high level. This tends to stretch the already crowded accommodations at the high school. And uh, it goes on. So then the uh, advocate article questions, where are all these students, youngsters coming from? <laughs> the answer is not an easy one for there appear to be several possible implausible explanations. Families are definitely larger than they were 20 years ago. Many youngsters are transferring to the public schools from private and parochial schools. Whatever the answer or answers may be, the fact remains that the public school population is climbing rapidly. Last June, slightly over 400 youngsters graduated from Arlington High School. This fall, 700 youngsters entered the first grades in the system. Wow. So. <clears throat> Welcome back, huh? We're back at it. Welcome back to where we were 54 years ago. 
Okay. That's amazing. Now, we're going we're gonna to have a report on health, nursing, and wellness. Sue Franchi, uh, welcome to the school committee meeting. And we're going to give you the, the floor. And put the mic as close to you as you can there. Yeah. All right. There you're right there you go. All right. And you can introduce yourself and take over. Hi, I'm Susan Franke. I'm the director of nursing for the Arlington Public Schools. Um, I will be joined in a second by uh, a colleague of ours, um, Ivy LaPlante, who is the director of the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. And she's, um, we're collaborating on some projects together, which I'll get into briefly. Um, so I'm just reviewing what's going on in terms of wellness in town. Arlington thrives in terms of wellness comparatively to the rest of the state. It, overall, it's a pretty healthy community. What we um, maybe struggle with is the same thing everyone else struggles with in terms of mental health in our youth, but we'll touch on that um, briefly. So thank you for letting me address the wellness initiatives and accomplishments this year, and we've continued to meet four times a year. Our last meeting will be June 1st. So I'll start with the physical fitness initiatives. Um, all of the schools continue to run programming uh, for students, which includes Fit Girls, amazingly popular, and Fit Boys and other running programs for boys as well with different titles. And there are about 250 fourth and fifth grade girls in the fifth Fit Girls program, which has been very successful. Um, also, uh, the Bach Be OK Bach morning workouts uh, continue, basketball, Zumba, PE Plus, and the 521 program at the Audison. Arlington High has morning badminton and the fitness room continues to remain open. I believe Larry Cronin from Fitness First donated even more equipment this year to AHS. Um, the FACTS program. Uh, they've implemented programming to reflect results from the Youth Risk and Behavior Survey, and that includes emphasis on stress management, the importance of wellness, behaviors, sleep, um, adequate sleep, etc. They not only have been working with students on healthy foods and lifestyle, money management, and consumerism, but as mentioned, added the components of mental health, wellness, which is greatly needed. Oh. That's why I took the stairs. I tried, and then the door was stuck. We're a wellness committee. We have to take the stairs. Yes, I did, and then the door was stuck. I apologize. And welcome, Ivy <laughs> LaPlante, right? Yes. Thank yes, you. Hello. Welcome. Thanks, Sue. No worries. Sorry, how no, far no, along we, did you get? We started early. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. good. I'm literally on page one. Okay. You're at the end of so. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, so the Safe Routes to Schools initiatives, um, robust programs throughout the community. I'm just going to move this a little bit just in case. Uh, continues to have monthly meetings, participation in bicycle and walking programs, <laughs> safety trainings and surveys. So that's going quite well. And I believe everybody has this in advance, this information yes. in advance. Okay, great. Food services, they continue the USDA Fred, uh, Fresh Fruit and Vegetables expanded program to the schools, more scratch cooking, less processed foods available, expanded <coughs> breakfast options and try it Tuesdays to introduce different foods to students. Uh, they've been working with the schools regarding composting procedures as well as working with um, students and families on alternative food fundraisers, uh, decreasing, uh, seeking to decrease unhealthy foods sold for fundraising programs and purposes. Uh, they've also been working with Arlington Eats in the community and we hope, or they hope to expand to the Audison. I really hope they expand to the Audison because we have about eight to ten students coming down a day for snacks because they don't have breakfast. Um, Parent and community forums. In September, there was the invitation sponsored by the Minuteman Safety and Health Col Collaborative in offering important health and safety tips for children entitled Passport to Bike Safety. Other Arlington forums uh, included the opioid crisis, the trans umbrella, guiding good choices, smoking cessation, and hypnosis. The talk with Dr. Shine, <coughs> marijuana use in the teenage brain, with Dr. Uh, Scott Hadland, Mental Health and Suicide Awareness Night, Parenting for Success with Less Stress, or How to Succeed Without Seceding from Family, and Adolescence is Hard Work with Michael Thompson. So um, I'm only going to touch on a few things with the Sanborn accomplishments, because there are quite a few, as listed um, Har um, Arlington High advisory activities, uh, courtesy of Club 84. Um, there's all sorts of information on, uh, for all staff on e-cigarettes because that's becoming a growing problem. It's easy to hide these vapes, as they call them. Um, handbook updates on tobacco use, 
and e-cigarettes, and uh, they've developed a commercial for Club 84 to be played during Club Day Advisory at the end of October. That happened already. The Great American Smokeout, uh, social media outreach, and let's see, there's a lot. I, the, Club 84 did quite a bit, actually, and smoking cessation classes continue for first-time offenders. Um, a planning for a skin that should have actually, I think, I don't know if that happened yet, Skin Cancer Awareness Day. And 15 Arlington High students attended the State House on March 16th to celebrate Kick Butts Day. Um, and part of the, that was also part with Club 84. There's a lot there. I'm not going to read it all because there's quite a bit of information there. Um, Relay for Life continues with an assembling teams, um, students directly involved with the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. And um, you've done some wonderful producing some wonderful materials and newsletters with that. Very, very professional and robust. Audison Middle School, Carly Newell continues uh, educating 405 students with um, smoking, preventing smoking, guiding good choices, as well as the parenting workshop, workshop mentioned previously. Uh, elementary schools, they, she continues to um, promote guiding good choices there as well. And the elementary health curriculum continues being te taught by teachers, uh, PE teachers, and nurses as well. Let's see. I'm just, I don't want to have to read every single thing on here. Mm -hmm. uh, Relay for Life, students in Arlington raised $56,497 in two, June 2015. Okay. Wow. See what they raised this year. That's very impressive. <clears throat> All uh, right, and many things that we've already kind of mentioned. So I'm going to go into some of the nursing initiatives because it's been a very robust year. Um, we had a grant from the Sims, the Sims grant, which gave us funding to run something called the OMS Web, Web standing acronym for Wellness, Energy, and Balance. It was a Monday afternoon program open to all students in the middle school, run by um, the two RNs, Julie Mele and Kristen Keneally. It was well attended, though we would have liked to have seen boys. This was not attended by boys, seemed to be girls. Um, it was to uh, look at mindfulness as alternatives to stress management, and they did all sorts of fun stuff. They will be presenting their um, program at a statewide meeting May 19th. Uh, the Innovative Care Coordination Grant from Mass Department of Public Health has funded two years of nursing coordination, almost full time. These two years we focused on mental health issues at Audison, originally high school, and then the Audison. Um, and throughout the district, this continues to be a serious issue, uh, having the adolescent population not knowing how to deal with stress and, 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 and having a hard time. Um, I did not bring in a PowerPoint presentation because our statistics this year are pretty comparable to last year. Um, we have two to three times the amount of encounters in the last three years as we this year as we did three years ago, excuse me. Uh, so it can, and a lot of these are related to mental health, school aversion, kids just not wanting to be a, in school or attending, um, having a hard time, having their phones with them so that they're caught up on social media while they're in school, tends to bring them down a little bit. Um, let's see. For many reasons, we reapplied for the grant this year, but we're focusing on diabetes and asthma management, and we will see, hopefully in the next few weeks, whether we get that grant. Last year it was 35,000. I was given, uh, plus change, some information that their DPH is looking to decrease funding on that because there are more. We piloted the program and it was so successful, there are more communities that now want to do it. So I don't think we're going to get as much this year if we get it at all. Um, the reason we're focusing on diabetes and asthma is because those numbers are drastically increasing in our community once again. There's a higher concentration of students in the Thompson area with diabetes. Um, we received the AEF grant to promote care coordination in the elementary schools. That was very successful in our, in our programming. Uh, the care coordinator went out to work with school nurses in the elementaries, specifically to help on cases of children with high absenteeism or chronic medical conditions. Um, again, diabetes came into play with that. Uh, this promoted greater engagement to local medical providers who are often unaware that their young patients were out of school so much. So we're getting some really good feedback on these programs. 
uh, the elementary school nurses have a greater understanding of the protocols, guidelines, and outcomes related to this outreach. It was a successful endeavor. It's a one-year grant, but we're really glad we did it. We hope to continue to have the Essential School Health Grant uh, from the DPH next year. This year we had a little over $69,000 for that. Um, it helps to fund our conferences and educational opportunities. It also gives us extra nurses in the schools to help out with the many different things that we're doing. The state just requires more and more from us and there's more and more students to see. Um, so I sincerely appreciate that the school committee has increased nursing coverage at the Odyssey and getting us closer to state guidelines in regard to the stu uh, nurse to student ratio. Um, let's see, what else did we do? We've housed nursing students this year from UMass, Regis, and Northeastern uh, at the Brackett, the Bishop, the Hardy, the Pierce, and the Audison schools. Um, I'm a CPR instructor, so we uh, were able to save quite a bit of money training in-house. We didn't have to send people out because we just did it for free. <laughs> um, and the Arlington Health and Human Services ran the flu clinics for all the students in the schools last fall, and they are now setting up the dates with the principals to run them again in the fall. We could not offer this to the staff because DPH did not um, give it to us. They, they give it to us for free um, for students, but it does not come free to anyone anymore. Um, and then recently, to wrap things up from my end, we received a $10,000 grant from MassDPH for the, initi the initiation of mandated screening regarding substance abuse. Um, I will defer, defer to the SBIRT, S-B-I-R-T grant and information to uh, my colleague Ivy LaPlante, who as I mentioned earlier is the director of the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Sue. Oh, yes, so SBIRT um, is commonly, is what it's commonly called. It stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. And just recently, uh, the governor, Charlie Baker, mandated this type of screening for all Massachusetts public schools. Um, Sue was really uh, forward thinking in trying to get the grant. She saw that this was the, um, the way that the uh, governor was going to go. And it was great because it allowed us to plan um, for this, this sort of screening before it actually happened. So I really thank Sue for inviting me into the program and for um, involving the Youth Health and Safety Coalition. As she mentioned, we do focus on substance abuse prevention um, and a lot of those initiatives, especially the, the tobacco initiatives for Club 84, are spearheaded by our youth coordinator, Karen Dillon, who works directly with the Arlington High School Club 84 program. So it was really nice to hear the connection between our coalition and the schools. Going back to SBIRT, um, screening brief intervention referral to treatment, like I said, um, is a now mandated screening process in the public schools. Um, and really it's exactly as it sounds. You know, it's a very simple uh, screening process um, where students will be asked a series of questions um, and depending on how they respond to them, you know, um, have you ever ridden a, in a car with somebody who's used substances? Um, do you yourself? Have you used, have you um, had a drink of alcohol in the past 30 days? Um, depending on how they respond, they will be given um, referral to treatment and kind of sort of like a, a small brief intervention. Um, our plan is to uh, screen all um, seventh graders in the Audison. And our thinking behind this is because, um, as you can see from the data in the packet, um, the majority of students um, are not using substances. However, when they do start, they're starting as early as um, seventh and eighth grade. So our goal is to stop use before it even starts. Um, and so this screening allows nurses to be able to talk to every single student in the Audison, all seventh grade students, and get them the treatment that they need. Um, by pairing with the coalition, uh, you know, we have the resources um, specifically for substance abuse prevention um, and connection to educational resources in the community. Every student will be given a packet after screening, um, so they all will receive the same information, so no student will be singled out. You know, oh, why did, why did Joe receive a packet but Susie didn't? No, every single student will receive the same um, type of information, uh, just to try to keep it as fair as possible. Um, the majority of students screened, uh, they've done pilot studies in the past, and the majority of students actually screen negative for substances, which is, it's great. Um, and you might ask, well, why should we do the screening if the majority of students are screening negative? 
because every single student receives a brief intervention and a um, positive reinforcement of the behavior that they're doing. So if these students are already making good positive decisions, um, specifically in avoiding substances, then they're being re, um, reinforced and reaffirmed for their positive decisions. Um, some logistics, um, we plan on rolling this out in November of next year. And um, we are currently working with the Audison principal um, and vice principals, and um, as well as uh, nursing teams as well. Um, and our plan is to have the nurses screen the students during PE courses um, so that when the students are kind of running around playing kickball, they're not noticing that their classmates aren't there. Um, the fact that every seventh grade student will receive the same screening is also a way to kind of keep it as fair. Um, and I do want to highlight that this is a confidential screening, so the students, anything that they say will just be between themselves and the screener. Um, I think. Um, I don't know if, Sue, did you want to add anything? Or I, I can open this up for discussion, so we'll, for questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll open it up. Thank you very much. Sure. Great presentation. Why don't I just open up Ms. Schlickman? Yeah, I mean, I, I seem to remember the stress issue is, mm. it seems to be magnified. Uh, I seem to remember from last year's data that, it, that, the, that our young women have higher incidence. Was, was that true? Mm, that's a good question. Y young, with stress, young women? Yes. I think that most of, because kids still continue to be hospitalized for mental health reasons, mm -hmm. and the majority of them are young women, yes. Yeah, because when you mentioned that you had your uh, stress management event, mm -hmm. and it was all girls there. All girls. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I thought that was sort of telling us data from last year. Right. Uh, is there something we need to be doing is a district to sort of make our environment better for this? Yeah, <laughs> shut down social media. <laughs> I'm serious. Because um, I live it at home. So um, that's a really good question. And, and, you know, and that's not to say that young men don't have this as well. Certainly mm. they do, and we see a lot of it. Mm -hmm. That's not to um, negate that fact. But I don't know. I mean, I really think it's a it's a... I, I think it's a perfect storm of, of things that cause it, to be honest with you. Um, and it's, it's trying to be addressed in many different respects. And, the, um, and I was reading the district goals, which are clearly aligned to social emotional well-being. This is not, like I said, this is not just specific to Arlington. This is everywhere. Yeah, I know. So uh, I wish I had the answer. I think it continues to be you know, supporting kids and letting them talk about what they need to talk about. And, mm -hmm. But how do we you know, reach them? I mean, I have my theories, and that $2 will get you a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> but um, it, I think we just have to continue fighting the good fight with this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's a, a lot of it's parenting, too. We want to see good, strong parenting mm -hmm. at home with this. It's, you know, we can't fix this just in the schools. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. Mm -hmm. well, that's okay. I mean, you, uh, social media is for cat pictures, yeah. right? So that, it shouldn't be stressful. No, but when you see I all know. the parties you're not invited to, yeah. And, yeah. you know, um, and everybody puts their perfect face on social media, mm -hmm. we don't realize how human we are. There's mm -hmm. a great book by, I, I don't know how to pronounce her name, I think it's Brene Brown, called The Gifts of Imperfection. Mm -hmm. I'm not into self-help books, but, but someone recommended that I read this because I also teach. And, uh, and I did, and, and I thought, wow, this is really, this, this woman's nailed it mm -hmm. with her perspective on why we're seeing this, not just in youth and adults too. I mean, I, I teach at a college and I work in college health also. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, the transition goes straight through college. Mm -hmm. Like I've never seen, I've been in college health in the same clinic for five years and I've never had so many freshmen come to see us at the beginning of the school year. They're not ready emotionally. Mm -hmm. They're not, many of them. I shouldn't say all of them, but I've, the numbers are pretty staggering as to what I see. Kids that just can't, they don't have the resiliency to take care of themselves mm. at that point. So, and that's just all based on stress and anxiety and. Uh, you know, the fact is, is that everybody looks perfect on social media. Of course they do. Uh, it, it is, it, it, that's not a unique phenomenon oh, because, really? you know, I, I remember I graduated from high school quite some time ago, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, but people, you know, I, I thought I was the only 
teenager going through certain things or liking certain things or whatever. And then, you know, as an adult, when you get to know people on a real level yeah. and not in this high school setting, you find out how much you had in common with folks that you never thought mm -hmm. you know, they, they were anywhere near <clears throat> where you were at. It, mm -hmm. It, it, it's a, it, it, it can be such a lonely time because you okay. feel like you're the only one going through this. Mm -hmm. And uh, adults, I, one, one of the things that I find with adults is they think that high school is such a wonderful time, but you're, you're really so restricted in your options. It, it, it's, in, in many ways, it's very confining mm -hmm. and very stressful to go, go through this uh, episode of trying to develop yourself as a person within the context of living with your parents and going through a high school with people mm -hmm. you were with since kindergarten. A lot of our students, so we work directly with um, youth in the high school and hope, hoping next year we'll work more with our middle school students. And a lot of our students say that the stressors that cause this anxiety, this um, frustration with school is because of a, a lack of things to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that's just the idea of social media and seeing all of you know the, uh, the perfect world of celebrities, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or if it's the fact that they really do not think or believe that there is anything to do. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our students are are turning to alcohol and to drugs because they think that is a way to have fun and to fit in. When mm -hmm. we see that the majority of our students are not using substances, mm -hmm. but they perceive that they are because the ones who have fun are the ones who are using substances and you know at these parties, mm -hmm. posting on social media, what have you. So, um, uh, you know, it's definitely what one of our uh, goals is to create more opportunities to support youth um, and to give them you know more fun things to do that aren't drugs and alcohol that are just you know getting together gathering I mean students talk so much about the last blast and how much fun that's going to be and how um, you know even students who have graduated mm -hmm. come back and they say oh man we wish that we had five last blasts that was so much fun because we were just with our classmates hanging out so um, we're really looking for opportunities to kind of create that cohesive uh, fun times um, where students can just just be be that be kids mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Starks um, so my question was about the testing. So it sounds like it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each student. Yes, correct. Um, and um, is it like, I don't, so it's the same person who talks to all the students. So the screening, we're, uh, Esper, we have a screening team and it's made up of um, uh, all the school nurses, essentially. Um, and then what we're going to do is, is um, essentially split up the class between the four or five nurses that we have doing the screenings um, and give them a list of students to screen. And what I'm gonna do beforehand is make sure that the nurse doesn't have a personal relationship with the student. Um, <clears throat> we don't want them to be the neighbor of somebody because mm -hmm. they're going to be disclosing mm -hmm. this personal con confidential information. Um, but there's only so much you can do to you know, protect that. Um, with that being said, after the screening, we're going to gather as a team along with all the guidance counselors at the Audison um, and discuss these cases. So any time that there is a student who has identified as a risk for developing a substance use disorder, that's essentially what the screening identifies, um, we'll have a chance to go through the, um, the process and talk to the, the person who screened the student will be able to talk um, about the issue with the student's guidance counselor and then refer to services mm -hmm. if they need to. With the student's consent. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. with the student's consent. Mm -hmm. Because again, this is a confidential screening between the student and the screener. And do, um, do we think that we might expand it in the future to other grades or just always, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, if you've hit them, that's great, but then what happens in ninth or 10th or? Will we, That's a great question. So the mandate from the state said pick one grade to start. Just one, okay. But the plan is to go, we'll start with the middle Seventh school. Grade. We want to get them young. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then expand to the high school the year after. So I think the high school is like seven be and ninth nine. Grade. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, That's what we're thinking. Yeah. And so we're piloting it this oh, okay. coming year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll see. But it's. So it's a work in progress. All right, mm -hmm. cool. It's the same screening tool that we use in medical offices. It's, yes. It, it's, um, it's a pretty uh, commonly used screening mm -hmm. tool. Yeah. Nothing mm -hmm. unpredictable. Cool, thanks. Mr. Hainer. Um, two questions, uh, one related to this. Do you see any connection between this issue and the anxiety? Between substance use and yes. anxiety? Oh, definitely. Okay. The, the other question I have, 
Do you have uh, statistics breakdown on grade levels at Audison on the anxiety? Yes, <laughs> I do. Mm -hmm. I, 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 guess. We, I don't have it with me. <laughs> no, but. no, no. That's not, if I may expand, I'm just seeing the issue of the new students coming in, mm. sixth grade is coming from uh, the elementary schools, not knowing anybody, mm -hmm. a higher level of anxiety on entrance. I mean, anxiety is caused by, as you said, social media and other things like that. Yes. But that particular thing and being new in the building and stuff like that, I don't know. If I it, don't see that. You don't see no, it? No, I, I don't see that. I mean, that's not to say there aren't sixth graders dealing with anxiety. There certainly are. Mm. I think it's the seventh and the eighth graders more, to be honest they, with you. In, in, are you able to determine that you could, seem very we could strong break down on those numbers? On, on the one of the major contributing factors is the social media. That's my personal belief. Okay. <laughs> that's that's that, that, and I apologize if I didn't preface that. My personal belief it is it is it, it, because this is what sometimes the kids will come in and say, you know, they're really upset, they're really upset, right. but they the won't tell you at first. Ang anxiety in school has been there forever. Yeah. And, and I'm an example of forever. We, I didn't have, the social media was just talking to somebody and asking a girl out when she said no, I'd be crushed, like that. Now it gets published right. uh, throughout the whole building. Exactly. To, to make it worse. Okay, thank exactly. you. I was just looking at our um, youth risk behavior survey data. We just received our brand new data um, today, this morning. And it's not even an electronic version, otherwise I would have shared it with you all. Um, once I get that, I'll be able to share it. But um, I was looking at it and we ask a question, you know, what brings the most stress to your life? This is high school students. We ask them homework, um, uh, friends, is it family problems, is it future thinking? And the majority of them say homework. It's say, you know, homework is what brings me the most stress and future planning is also. And if you, if you take those two issues, you can't eliminate homework and you can't eliminate future planning. So it might just be the, the compounded effort of, um, you know, everything that's adding to it, yeah. so. And I'm sure we have the, that data as well for the middle school and it's broken down. Um, it's on, it's on, our, on the website. So yeah, we can pull up. We can pull it very up. specific data as mm -hmm. you know, how many kids. We can we can divide it out by grades, what they're coming yes. down for specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure you have like actual data too. But it's pretty comparable to last year's That's data. Good. Thank you. Anybody other questions? So my my question is, uh, do you have do you have data that if you look back at data and how far back can you go and what do the trends tell you? So is there an increase in stress uh, in our students? Statistically, yes. uh, and how far back does your data go? Um, I have a, a graph that's coming to my head right now from 2009, 2011, 2013, and 2015. So those four years, and we are seeing an increase in stress among high school and middle school students. All grade levels? All grade levels. Okay. Even the little ones, I mean. Even uh, elementary school students? So there's an increase in stress, and you think that that trend line from 2009 to 2000. 2016 is media related as well. That's your theory, right? So we're oh yeah, but no, are there I'm not a psychologist? I know. <laughs> I know. I just want to preface that. Okay, but are, are there any other theories? I guess. I guess I, even more more than theories. When you're when you're talking to students, um, and you're in your and they're you're interviewing them, and you're mm -hmm. doing an assessment of their situation. Uh, what other things do you see besides uh, my friends were invited to a party mm -hmm. and I wasn't and uh, I saw it on social media, I saw it on Facebook or wherever they saw it. Certainly a lot of friend, you know, peer issues, I think that's probably number one. But they, they will talk about um, the stress of their work in class. Yeah. Um, sometimes we can even look to see if there's a trend of which class they're coming from a lot. Yeah. Um, and home life, sometimes they'll say things are tough at home. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say peers, you know, peer issues are number one. If, if I, okay. Yeah, and Dr. Chesson, I was going to ask you the next question, so good. <laughs> um, one of the things that many districts have started to look at, um, there's an actually a documentary called The Race to Nowhere, mm -hmm. um, and it is very common at the high school level for students to feel a pressure, unlike the pressure that we might have seen before. A vast majority of kids are going on to college, where before there were might have been other options. You might have gone you know, into work, or it might have been more accept more acceptable or more common to go into the service. Now that the vast majority of kids are, are at least striving to go to college, 
um, it, it doesn't surprise me that you say homework. We see kids that you, in the past when kids used to take one or two AP classes, now you know, it's the norm to take four or five. And that creates a level of stress and anxiety for students. And that's something we're, we're going to be working on. That's one of the reasons that we were happy to get a grant from the Arlington Educational Foundation to really look at safe and supportive schools and to do a master plan over the summer for a K through 12 program. Thank you, because that, I mean, that, that's where I was getting at. I think, that's, I think social media is certainly a part of it, but I also think that we have you know, raised our standards. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a town with, with higher expectations for young people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more competitive education, academically, all, which is all very positive, very positive, something we've worked on as a committee. We've wanted to accelerate uh, academic outcomes. We've been working hard on that over the past decade or so. But I think one of the outcomes, one of, the outcomes of all that is that that increases stress. Well, sure, because what are, what are all the seniors doing right now? Yeah, they're stressed. Well, it's, it's uh, May, so they've already decided, right? They've gonna, decided, yeah. but it's all still being posted. And yeah. about those at a wait list, look, and I'm yeah. living this right now. So I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I can tell you. Um, you know, the wait lists, uh, they're, you know, I, I joke around with everybody. and say, well, right now, my daughter's a puddle. You know, we just, the yeah. whole thing has been stressful, you know, and, and, and it's, I just, compound that throughout mm -hmm. the district. And it gets worse. I'm, I was just thinking the other day, if there's X amount of colleges, but the population's increasing, it's a lot more rejection letters, yeah. right? So, because there's fewer spots in the colleges to take these students that are coming up. I mean, Ben and Jerry's has to come out with an ice cream seasonally called rejection letter. <laughs> you think I'm, I'm serious. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. I believe it, that's why. Yeah, the, yeah. I'll yeah, buy it. That's right. So we'll <laughs> buy it. <laughs> Well, the other thing with college acceptances is the technology makes it easier to apply for more colleges. Right. Mm. So you've got more people applying for seats, so you know, more of a chance for rejection on that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, front alone. And more students right. applying. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's huge. Exactly. So in this summer, you're going to be doing some planning around yeah. how, do we, how do we provide more support, how are we more proactive? Yep, K through 12 safe and supportive schools. That, that'll be the summer. That's part, and that's part of our goals, proposed goals for FY17. Great goal. Yeah, that's great. All right. Any other questions? I would like to just say one thing. Counter, I wanted yeah. to do a shout out to Julie Dunn. Yes. She oh, helped yeah. me um, write a lot of the grants that we received in the mm -hmm. last few years, and she's been phenomenal. So um, I, I just want to let you know, I think that I greatly appreciate the work that she's done. Very talented. Julie is the, uh, Julie Dunn is the grant administrator and also the director of communications for the district and she does a phenomenal job. She does. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate okay, thank it. Thank you. All, all right, well, would, it, would people object to maybe inviting uh, the cultural competent Competency group to make a presentation, Mr. Schlickman, and um, I mean, we, yeah, I, I think that the you know because it's the superintendent's goals, I think we should do it with the superintendent. Going to the superintendent. Okay. Would you like to? Do I, I don't object. Discussion? So, Gibbs discussion. So, would, uh, would Dr. Chesson like to tell us about how Park is going? Right. No. Well, let's get the Gibbs. Let's stay we with our agenda. Go to we'll Gibbs. do Gibbs. Yeah, please. So, right. if you so want, I can summarize with. Yeah. So why don't we, uh, Dr. Bodie sent us a. Um, a memo this afternoon or this morning recommendation. Not, no, recommendation on the Gibbs uh, recommending that the Arlington School Committee adopt uh, or, or direct her to con reconfigure the Gibbs as a sixth grade school and Dr. Chesson uh, is the, the uh, assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment and is best uh, prepared as Dr. Bodie to talk to this issue so why don't you summarize this for us sure um, uh, as uh, you, Mr. Thielman just said um, Dr. Bodie's recommendation is that the school committee um, configure the Gibbs school as sixth grade only and so I just want to summarize a few of the points that she has um, taken into consideration. Um, having all sixth graders together in the same school um, will present a unique opportunity for those seven school students from seven elementary schools to come together as a class. It'll also present an opportunity for us to develop a specialized schedule. Right now, the sixth grade schedule is subject to the seventh and eighth grade schedule constraints. And so this would allow us to develop a schedule that was much more focused on the needs of sixth graders. 
Um, having a sixth grade only school uh, versus a sixth through eighth grade school eliminates the potential for inequity um, between two very unevenly sized sixth um, through eighth grade middle schools. So if we created two middle schools, one would be almost twice the size of the other. Um, sixth grade students, as we heard today, can um, benefit socially and emotionally from having this transition year and from having a much more personalized education. Um, there is definitely, and if you've ever been in a middle school, there's a notable difference between sixth grade and eighth grade students. Um, and a difference in school can be both um, beneficial and detrimental. So that would be something that we would be able to target our work towards those students. Um, also, bringing those students together from the seven elementary schools um, would allow them to have a larger um, pool of students with a similar interest. With two smaller middle schools, you would only be able to meet um, a portion of the schools. And this would allow us uh, to uh, develop an identity that could be better nurtured in a small learning environment. Um, there has been some discussion about the n n additional transitions that students would have to go through. And generally when those are fo more focused on um, is looking at individual students moving from school to school or district to district. Um, but in this situation, the sixth grade would move as a cohort. So this, would, we believe, would mitigate the, the effect of moving from one building to another because they're moving with their friends. And also, um, as we talk to the people, folks in Needham, um, we need to um, just be cognizant of that transition and plan for it ahead of time. Um, the Gibbs School is a much more navigable school than the Audison Middle School, um, and that's an understatement, I think. Um, incoming sixth grade students who are transitioning from smaller elementary schools will most likely have um, at least be able to feel like the Gibbs is a little bit more manageable, or a lot more manageable, actually, than the Audison Middle School. Uh, smaller schools have been shown to increase a sense of community and um, positive school culture is really important at the sixth grade level. And finally, the incremental costs of a sixth grade only school are about half of those um, that would be incurred if we replicate a sixth through eighth uh, grade school, primarily because of the number of programs that would have to be replicated for equity. And so those are the, that's the summary of, um, I think, the major points that Dr. Bodie took into consideration when making this recommendation. Okay, so I think what we can do before Dr. Bodie comes um, is just ask Dr. Cheston any questions you want about the configuration. In terms of the timeline, at the last school committee meeting, uh, Dr. Seuss announced that the, uh, we're going to hold a public hearing at Town Hall on Tuesday, May 24th at 7 p.m., Tuesday, May 24th at 7 p.m., and there'll be a presentation by Dr. Bodie on the sixth grade versus six through eight model, and there'll be also presentations by members of the Audison Middle School staff. And then <clears throat> a possibility was to vote on uh, the 26th of May. Anyone can make a motion whenever they want. But before we make a motion, maybe we can just ask Dr. Chesson any questions she has about this recommendation, or anyone can opine on, on the recommendation of Dr. Bodie. So we get a sense. Mr. Cardin. Uh, yes, I know <clears throat> uh, Ms. Elmer is not here, but has there been any progress in addressing the concerns of the special education teachers about the sixth grade model? Can you say which of those concerns that you... Well, the presentation in April, the survey of the Audison teachers, the subgroup of the special education teachers, 70% were against the sixth grade only model. I think there was a concern about whether there would be, uh, we would replicate the programs at the, Audis, uh, the, at the Gibbs for sixth grade, and the um, incremental costs that um, Dr. Bodie has given actually have replicated those programs. So that was a concern. There was a concern that if we had two middle schools, would there just be um, those special education programs at one school as opposed to at both schools? And with their sixth grade only recommendation and with the incremental cost um, stating that there would at least be consideration if there were students that needed an, um, an, a specialized learning community that we would have those programs at, um, at the Gibbs. I think that has answered the vast majority. of That was really what their concerns were cent centered around. They wanted to ensure that students that were in an included environment for their special education plan would be able to have those opportunities, but there would also be those specialized learning communities for the, any student that needed that, and her incremental cost plan um, accounts for both of those. 
because Ms. Elmer had said she was preparing two different models, but I didn't, and clearly that model would be one model. Do you know what the other model would be? My understanding is that whatever the other model is has been set aside. Okay, thank you. So if there's a need for students in a, in a supported learning community, yes. an SLC at the, at the Gibbs in the sixth grade, we're it will be that provided, that yes. Provided. Okay, that was the major. That's issue. what's included in the incremental cost budget for, at this point. Okay, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, I mean, uh, just one one minute, Mr. Schlickman. Sure. So, Dr. Allison Ampey sent you and I an email. Yes, I'm question. about to read that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey sent an email uh, with the uh, following topics that she'd like to see addressed uh, going to the future, uh, and the topics are: How will concerns of our special education specialists be addressed? How would we make transitions less problematic for our special education students and our other students? How will we address the effects under a Gibbs sixth only configuration on traffic? Arlington wide near Gibbs, and what is our plan to address a mitigation of any increased traffic? So those are her four questions. And also she asked that these be uh, addressed in advance of the next meeting so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pass that on to dr. Bodie I mean I, I believe I've answered the first question right. I'm not aware of um, what the plans are regarding the mitigation of traffic um, I will make sure that dr. Bodie has those concerns now I, 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 I want to say something on my own observation about traffic is that the traffic at the Addison right now is pretty awful and the the geography there is difficult because you're dropping off in a configuration of uh, narrow and or dead end streets. So it, it, you know this is not the ideal place for pickup and drop off for for a school community. Now, obviously, we're generating traffic to the Odyssey from all over town. So that compared to what we're doing at the Odyssey now, we're just sort of splitting it. So that the, what's now the Odyssey sixth it would be moving to the Gibbs, which would relieve the pressure at the Odyssey. It certainly wouldn't be as great a reduction if we went to uh, 678 on both ends mm -hmm. of town and people didn't have to cross mm -hmm. through the middle. But it certain, I, I view it as an improvement over what, what currently happens. And the question that I asked Monday night was that all our elementary schools are walked to. Uh, but there are a lot of cars hanging around these schools in the morning. So just because it's a walk, to, uh, it's within walking distance, doesn't mean that the, the kids will actually walk to school. That's uh, correct. They will still generate a lot of cars, regardless of if it's four blocks or or, or forty blocks. You know, it's uh, it, it is what it is. So. Um, I'm looking upon it in, in a couple of ways. First of all, the Finance Committee has said, you know, you really need to be look, looking critically at the sixth grade only model over at the Gibbs because of the incremental costs. It would cost more to duplicate. Secondly, the educational recommendations from the superintendent, I think, are very compelling. Um, <coughs> excuse me, that in itself are, are, are good reasons, but I think that there's a certain element of disruption as well because instead of bringing kids together, the split would necessitate students who are now currently Bishop students being split apart. And rather than being a unifying factor of having the sixth grade together, to actually take that Bishop community and disassemble it between Otteson and, and Gibbs because the, the two, you know, five plus two is seven and that doesn't divide evenly by by three, so you know, you're gonna have some very unhappy people in the center of town, which is my neighborhood. So uh, unless, unless something really, really impressive comes down the road between now and the end of the month from this public hearing, um, the, the pillars seem to be lined up, at least in my mind, to go for sixth grade over at the Gibbs. And I, I, you know, I don't want to you know, I, I want to have every opportunity for everybody to have their say, but I don't want it, I, I don't want it to be perceived 
that we're not at least leaning, or at least I'm not at least leaning in a direction, because we've been looking at this issue for over a year, and there's been a lot of evidence placed before us. Let me just uh, so summarize for the superintendent and for the chair. The chair's let me gonna, uh, let me well let me finish this uh, part of the meeting, then she takes over. Um, so we're talking about uh, the proposal by Dr. Bodie to reconfigure the Gibbs School as a sixth grade. We discussed. We, I presented the, reminded people of the timeline we talked about, which was a public hearing on uh, May 24th, and then a vote, a, possibly a vote on May 26th. Uh, uh, Mr. Cardin uh, raised questions about the uh, supported learning communities, the SLCs. Dr. Chesson answered that we, uh, if necessary, we can uh, have a, an SLC. Uh, I, at the I said it's included in Dr. Bodie's it, incremental cost budget. It's in, included in Dr. Bodie's incremental cost budget. There were questions about uh, uh, traffic, and that's what we're talking about now. And Mr. Schlickman, who is an expert on traffic, you are in some respects. <laughs> I, I've memorized the uh, MUTCD. Yeah, so that's, that, that's an expert, uh, has enlightened us on it. Anyone else want to speak? Go. Um, so I think that while we do have to work with the town and come up with a plan for traffic, I don't think that that's necessarily something that we have to solve before we make a decision. I don't think that we're gonna be able to have every I dotted and every T crossed once we've made the decision. Um, and I think what we need to do is make the decision so we can start doing all of that work. Um, and I really still feel that I'm not really sure why we're having this forum on the 24th because between the superintendent's recommendation, the school enrollment task force is leaning and and the finance committee's recommendation and um, all of the audison staff and administration and their recommendation that it be a sixth grade i really want to know if anyone on this committee if a thousand parents showed up and screamed at us that it had to be a six through eight would we actually change our mind because i feel like it is up to us to make this educational decision and we are all, I mean, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm not gonna change my mind. And so I feel like we are having this forum on the 24th and I feel like it's a false forum because we have already made a decision. There, I really feel like we are so far into making this decision and I think that we should vote it tonight and that we should make the 24th a forum on why we're moving in the direction we're going and why we made the decision and start having people help us create committees who are gonna to start to think through some of the solutions to some of the problems that we're gonna have in making this. I think that the longer we wait, I, I, I just feel like we don't need to wait any longer and I just feel like the longer we wait, it just muddies the waters. Okay, so Ms. Stark said she wanted to talk about this tonight and we said we'd wait until the chair and the superintendent were here, they're here, Mr. Hainer, then Mr. Cardin, and then we'll go over here, okay? So, I agree Bill. with you. When everything Ms. Stark said, uh, I was ready to vote for this configuration after the first time the superintendent, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. When the superintendent brought it forward, I still had misgivings, but I was totally converted after my trip to Needham, uh, and I was ready to go for that then. We initially uh, talked about having a forum back at the beginning, uh, the beginning of this month. For whatever reason, it was canceled. Then the idea was not to vote until after the vote June 14th, and then we had, uh, when this, the task force came up with their final vote and discussion from the finance committee and uh, on the incremental costs and stuff, we then decided to have a forum. I agree with Ms. Starks. I think this is the way to go for education, for the best uh, parts from the kids. We've got uh, support from uh, the teachers, from the superintendent and everything, and it's the financial way to go. I agree that on the 24th, we come together as a school committee and educators and stuff and explain to the parents and respond to any issues that the parents have. Traffic, as it seems to be, I've had a couple of emails on that. A person got up the other night at town meeting and discussed that. Mr. Schultzman said it. The worst traffic in the world of all our schools is the Audison currently, with an increased population, and it, it's just that much, uh, it's there. It's a bad situation. And people will be driving to the uh, kids even if they live two blocks away. That, that's a fact. So I'm in support of what uh, Ms. Stark said. 
Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So this decision is going to affect every single student in Arlington, third grade or below, every <coughs> single future student coming in Arling into Arlington. So maybe we should have had a parent forum earlier, but we did not. So I think we owe it to our parents to listen to them. I am undecided if a thousand parents in the great majority take the time to listen to the presentation of the superintendent, listen to the presentation of the students, of the teachers, and still lobby me and still insist that the uh, two middle school solution is better, I'm going to take that seriously and it does, it may change my vote. So, so I am in favor of proceeding with the forum as planned uh, and, and I, I think people who are following this understand that a majority of the committee very much favors the sixth grade option only. Uh, and those of you can, can state that at that meeting as well at the beginning to, 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 to put, that on, put them on notice. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it's such a major decision. It affects every single student uh, that I do think we need a chance for parent input in a, in a formal manner. Okay, Dr. Seuss. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Mr. Cardin. I, so the way I see things have having happened is that we put off this discussion until it was clear that Gibbs was going to be the option. And we kept saying to ourselves and, and to each other, um, we're not yet talking about the configuration because we still have not finalized the decision about Gibbs. And the, the task force had not finalized the decision. And that just happened relatively recently. Um, I don't see the need to make the decision you know, two weeks earlier or two weeks later necessarily. What we need to do is absolutely make the decision by the end of the year so that when they start doing the construction documents, we have that information. Now, um, I know that two of my, the members who are most urging us to do the make decision now had very different opinions earlier. But you've gone through a process and you've heard some different thoughts and you've, you've changed your mind. The parents haven't gone through that process. They, some of them have been tuned in from the very beginning. Some are just starting to tune in now. They have initial feelings. They haven't really heard from everyone. We need to give parents the opportunity to hear the information that we've heard um, and voice their opinion, their thoughts, their concerns to us. And I just don't see an advantage to rushing a decision that is, is it, as Mr. Cardin says, it's a huge decision. It's, it, it's a big decision about the, the structure of education in Arlington. Dr. Boyd, did you want to comment? Do I want to comment? Um, well, I, well, I will be happy to be there on the 24th to hear thoughts that people have, worries, concerns, to the extent that they can be answered then, that would be terrific. If there, if there are questions that need further research, then those are questions that we could um, look at and create an FAQ later. Um, so I, I think there's some value in that part of it. I, I, I got to say this. We took, we invited the staff to come when the in, enrollment task force, they came and did a lengthy presentation. We questioned them. This is an open, we're on TV, it's presented several times. Parents should be aware of this. If we continue to, I'm not saying we have to take the vote tonight, but if we continue to delay because people have questions they want answered, this can be stalled ad infinitum. We, you've stated we have to take a vote. My understanding, first off, this meeting on the 24th has to be sponsored by somebody, and I, I, I think it should be the school committee that is sponsoring this and running this. It should be a, a school committee meeting just for this purpose. On the 26th, I pushed at the, other, the last school committee meeting, uh, the special one that we had. The 26th should be the drop dead date for us to vote on this. If people continually, I, if people have questions to ask, parents or anyone else, from the committee or anyone else, they should be given to Dr. Bodie before the 26th, uh, the 24th, not at that night, because it, we can stall this forever. Mr. Schlickman. Okay. I, th you know, f from my perspective of having been through, having been at every meeting and having be been through this and having lived and breathed the, the uh, decision surrounding the Gibbs for a year, um, I am very comfortable with the decision and would happily take a vote right now. Um, I don't think that waiting two weeks is going to change the result. My one, I, I have concerns on two sides of the table side of the table one is that we're going for a debt exclusion vote and the earlier we can tell people with uh, definitively what we are doing 
I think is better. And I don't want to see decisions that are likely to be made being held out. Uh, I'd rather be able to go and say definitively, we are going to make this a sixth only, and this is the reason why. On the other hand, we have a new member of this committee who hasn't gone through the process. Um, and given the atmosphere that we have just set forth, that we do have, seem to have a majority of the committee that seems to be firmly committed to uh, give six, um, I think the message to the community is out there. Uh, for that reason, I think we can wait two weeks to cast the vote on the 26th to allow uh, Mr. Cardin to have the benefit of a forum and, and, and the folks who show up, as well as the evidence that we've pr presented to this point. But I also agree <clears throat> firmly with Mr. Hainer that we will vote this on the 26th and we will make a firm decision and I see no reason to wait any further. Okay, uh, do you have? I have another. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I, I guess my perspective is I see no disadvantage in waiting. We know that we don't have to make any decisions about plans until um, the summer and until after the vote, and I see a real disadvantage in, in being s perceived by the community to have rushed what is a very significant um, decision and not have heard from all the stakeholders. So. I just, I don't see any downside to waiting at all. I mean, I understand that people are frustrated, but I just don't see any downside. And I do see a real serious downside with um, being perceived to have not heard from everyone. So on the 26th, on, you be comfortable with the vote? No, no, I mean, I, I feel like we've, um, that, that we'll, we'll be more, we'll be ready, the community will be more ready. And I feel like that is a, a valuable thing to, ha to do. I just don't see any downside to, wait, to waiting. Right, well, there's no, no motion on no. the table for us to debate. And I think if it were made, it might be defeated. So. Why don't we, I mean, Mr. Cardin, if we, I know you don't know what will happen, but you think on the 26th you'll have enough information to be able to cast a vote? Yes, certainly, yes. Okay, and so, Ms. Starks? Okay, so I really want there, I want to understand what the planning is then for the 24th, what the message is that we're sending, and I want to be very clear with people where we stand, mm -hmm. okay? Because I really, I really feel like we have sold this as a forum to help us make a decision, and that's, I so. I'm really not using it as that. And so I don't want, I'm, I'm worried that we are giving the wrong impression because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain how I'm gonna vote and where I'm gonna vote. And you know, I just, because I understand that people wanna have a walkable school and I understand that they want a middle school near them and I hear those concerns. But I also have heard the educational and the financial, and I feel like that is how I'm gonna vote. And so mm -hmm. I'm just worried that we are sending the wrong message. So I really wanna make sure that the message we send on the 24th is that we're really close to making this decision, and what we want is to hear things that people wanna make sure that we hear and make sure that we know how we're gonna, you know, things that we can put on a list to make sure that we handle moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I don't want it to be sold as a, come and let us know which way you think we should do this. Because it, that's really not what it is. Okay, all right, and got that's it. What I want Maybe Dr. Sure. Bodie and Dr. Seuss can just talk to the, 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 uh, f the uh, schedule or the agenda for the forum on the 24th, which I've always understood was gonna be sponsored by the school committee you're gonna chair, right? right. Okay. Oh, that's fine. I, we weren't sure. I wasn't sure if it was a forum, but that's fine. Yeah. Well, what you, yeah, yeah. So, so what have you kind of given some thought to uh, how, what it's going to look like and what the presentation is going to look like? Why don't we talk about that? All right. Um, the thinking is that it's also a forum for education. While we think that a lot of people are watching us this evening, <laughs> some, some do, some be. don't. They may not there are be. better shows on <laughs> TV. It may not be their, their favorite yes. rerun either. Yeah. Um, but... I think that uh, there are a lot of people who are just learning about this, and I think they'd like to hear what my rationale is for both the Gibbs just as a school and then Gibbs as a sixth grade. Um, so that's what I would plan to do, and also maybe show, show them some of the sketches. Now, the, the Odyssey teachers are very much want to come and also 
give their perspective on why they think this is the best option as well. In fact, when I, they, they've been bounced a, a couple, over a couple of dates, and each time I've mentioned a new date, they're just right there. So they're, they're very eager to share that. So I think that it might be an opportunity for people who want to know, understand better and have specific questions about this or express some of their concerns because there, there, there are going to be concerns and people are going to be anxious and, uh, about this. Um, and so I think it's an opportunity for them to hear. You know, if, if you've already voted, it, it still could be a valuable forum regardless of whether you vote tonight or later because I, I think I see it more as an opportunity for education. Could, okay. could, yep. Going along with this, could we have all the documents that we've received uh, from the teachers, from you prior and tonight, could we make those available online for the, for, for the community ahead of time? So people come mm -hmm. in and, and that... Yeah, we can, we can, well, I, we can I understand that, them. but maybe mark it in not some way. In, not buried in Novus. Yeah, yeah. but I put, put in the, put them all in on one on spot website. on the yeah. website where it, so yeah, that, with an yeah. invitation to come the 24th yes. to learn more. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, that way. so, uh, so I think one, okay, I think we got to close this discussion. So I think the, um, and then talk about goals because we have people yes. been waiting for over an hour here to talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> so I think, um, what we can do is, I mean, if it's a sense of the committee that we want to, we want to have on the agenda for the 26th, which Dr. Seuss draws up with Dr. Bodie the weekend, a week before, a few days before, we can have on the agenda, if that's everyone's position, vote on uh, Addison Middle School configurations. Is that? 26th, yeah. On the yes. 26th. Okay, so let's, by agreement, yes. we don't need to take a motion. The agenda on the 26th of May will have on it a uh, item that says vote on sixth grade configuration. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. I think we're going to close the conversation and go to the goal. Yep. But there's also on here the timeline. Well, that's the timeline. It was just we did. Which it, was is, just, um, it was actually put on here before we talked on Monday. So we now sort of know the timeline. Okay, so but what so when are we voting as well? We have to vote to take the Gibbs back. Um, we have to have that formal vote. Oh, yeah, we should yeah. do that that's that's on the, the last meeting. Well, so that, it's just, so that has to be done at the because otherwise we don't have any money to do anything yes. with it. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's not. Yeah. That was, uh, no, 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 Okay, no, Mr. Schlickman. Let's make it no, no. contingent. Uh, we no, can no, take a vote no, contingent no, on no, you. No, I, you know, <laughs> I, I think that we're going to, I think the uh, debt exclusion is going to happen. However, I don't want to make this contingent on the debt exclusion. Right. Because what happened, okay, let's say hypothetically, what happens if the debt exclusion fails? It means we can't renovate the building. Right. But Schools for Children is already moving out. Right. The, it is a school, there are classrooms, and we may have to occupy that without doing a renovation. I don't want there to be a, a thought that well, if the debt exclusion fails, well, maybe they won't take the building back right. because we need to. And if we can't do the renovation, we're, gonna, we're, we're so desperate for space, we'll probably do something with it over, over the course of the time while we're waiting to get approval for the renovation. Now, I have full confidence in this town that they're going to go to the ballot on June 14th and vote yes for this debt exclusion so we can do the renovation. But even if we don't, we can't afford to put that building in limbo for another year, especially with one of the tenants already committed to moving out. Okay, uh, Dr. Bodhi, would, would, do you have any response to that? Does that sound like good? It's possible. One of the things I think that's been rather shocking to us as a town is the cost of modular classrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think as this whole area only needs more of them, the market is going to make them more expensive. So I think that that could be a calculated thing that we'd have to look at. It certainly would not be ideal because of the, because there's a lot of things we would, there are things we would actually have to do, I think, unless we label it a temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, in temporary, uh, uh, temporary you can get around some of the, um, some things. But um, it certainly wouldn't be ideal because it would never be perhaps uh, the used the way it could be used, but yes, it's possible. It would not be ideal because it be wouldn't be the number that we would have there 
at all. All right, so we have a request from two members for the next agenda on the 26th to also include a vote on repurposing Gibbs. Yes. Yes. Three. Three members. Mm -hmm. Four members. No, no. Oh, no. Oh, you, you have a, no, no. Sorry, you want to speak to it? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. Um, sorry yeah, so I, I, I disagree. So I've talked to Dr. Bowie about this. What I understand is that we could not say stick stu students in there for any long period of time without, without money, really. That's right. Uh, but we could stick them in there for a temporary time for maybe the rebuilding of the high school. So we, it, you know, potentially it could be used, but, but we couldn't without doing a lot of renovations, which would be very expensive, add, put sixth graders there or something, from what I understand. Um, a major reason during the long-range plan discussions that we decided to do a June 14th vote was it was felt to be unfair to make a decision about the Gibbs tenants without the money in hand. So here's another case where I don't see any harm in waiting. Um, I think it, it, it gives the voters, you know, it, it, the original decision for making it June was the right thing to do would be to have the money in hand and then say to the Gibbs tenants formally, I mean, they already know what's happening, but formally, um, we're now formally taking it over. Um, I, I don't think, I just don't think it's going to help the campaign. I just don't, I don't see any great advantage of it. Mr. Carton, you want to weigh in on this year? Are you comfortable? Uh, yes, I was I just going to say the same thing. I mean, I think the, the correct order is, as has been discussed with other actors in town, and again, we're not acting alone, is first get the money and then give the notice. Everybody knows what's happening. Right. Everybody knows, it's, uh, Mr. Schlickman said that it's, it's extremely likely that we are gonna get the money. The tenants are looking for other space. The, it's just a formal notice procedure. They're not gonna get the notice anyways from the town. It's the town, it's the town administrator that's gonna, that gives the notice. Um, uh, he's not gonna give the notice till the end of June anyway. Right. So to us to vote to take the school back before we have money to do anything with it just doesn't seem quite right. What are your thoughts? Mr. Schlickman. Well, whether there's a majority right now who's thinking this way or not, I think the, the uh, possibility of be on the agenda so that if there are four votes to take it back, okay. then it should be there. So I'd like to ask that that be on the agenda. Okay, so I think what we have on the agenda is, yeah. is uh, vote on configuration, mm -hmm. uh, grade configuration at Gibbs Middle School, mm -hmm. vote on configuration at Gibbs Middle School, discussion on repurpose of Gibbs. And vote. Potential vote. I want, I want the possibility of a vote. Potential vote. I think in the meantime, we, I mean, Mr. Cardin makes a good point. It's the town manager who signs the agreements uh, with the um, tenants, and it's the school district that has the power to repurpose the building, correct? Our role, your role in this, is to basically take it out of surplus, to re, <clears throat> now, beyond. We have nothing to do with the leases there while it is under their control. Um, the time, the, we may need the building regardless, but the, the timing, you, you have time until the end of June to make the decision. Why don't, we, why, don't we, why don't we also, do we have the actual vote from Doug Hyam? Do we need, to, is there I, language I, for the I vote? Requested, I requested that several meetings ago that, that someone find out the specific language from town council and my understanding, when I talked to him privately, was that the school department can declare a building surplus and request it be taken out of surplus. The town has the final decision on that. So hmm. the, the only vote that we would be having on the 26th regarding this is a request. Mm -hmm. And I would ask, once again, to get town council mm -hmm. to give us counsel on this. We, I have. Um, okay. And he said... There, there's no certain kind of motion, not like MSBA that you have to have every, every I and, and T, every I dotted, T crossed. Um, in fact, just what you said is probably a sufficient l wording for what you need to do. It's not, yeah. yeah. Well, it's to take it out of surplus. It, it's a request to take it out of surplus. Okay. Mr. Schlick made a request for vote. We can. Yeah, I, I, want, I want to be able to vote it in two weeks uh, if a majority of the membership so desires. Okay, so I think we've discussed this, and, um, and the chair is back, and this topic is over, and the school committee is in much better hands now. So <laughs> one thing no, left. no, I don't think back so. Back to work. Now, so the only thing we have left to do yeah. are the district goals. And the, okay, great. Go ahead. Because okay. we've done everything else. We've done everything else. Okay, great. And we've done the reports, too? All the reports, yep. yeah. yeah. we did everything. What? Yeah, I should go. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Way more efficient than I am, clearly. You're on three more. Yeah. 
You're on three more committees, though. Goals, goals, goals. <laughs> Goals, goals, okay. goals. Um, so just to uh, let you know what we're doing right now, the remaining thing is we have two things, and they're related. Um, we uh, want to give a first viewing of the district goals um, that then will be discussed uh, more fully at, at the subcommittee meeting. Um, and we also want to hear uh, from the, uh, di uh, the superintendent's um, what is it called? Diversity. It's a diversity Advisory Committee, um, who have uh, a suggestion for uh, an addition to our district goals. And we and I have to say, if you've seen Dr. Bodie's goals, there is something on there, but it's not it's not exactly I know what your suggestion is. So I'd like to um, consider them both in the next few weeks, and um, I'd like to invite uh, who's speaking to this. I don't uh, we have we have the, the whole pretty much the whole team here. There's a few people missing, but um, this has been a, a, a terrific group of people that I work with on a regular basis to talk about these issues, um, as well as plan. Uh, Mr. Spiegel's on that committee, and Mr. Hainer Kimes, and to talk about um, how we can increase um, the diversity of our staff. And they've been worked. They've worked very very hard with us to put coffees on they've reached out to all of the these applicants to invite them personally which has had um, a very positive it made a very positive impression on the candidates who've come to our coffees which we have been told so they are a committee that both thinks about these things in a very um, deep way but also roll up their sleeves and help when we need to get some things done so they have um, submitted a rationale and ideas about uh, cultural proficiency goal we could begin I'm fine with beginning with uh, their presentation yeah I think that'd be easier that'd be yeah. great um, so oh come on Miriam come on Stein up. So Miriam Stein is and Pearl Morris yeah, actually why don't you guys up. introduce yourselves and um, and it'd be great if you gave us a definition of cultural competency because I know that it's, it's in the yeah for the viewers at home Unfortunately, there's only one mic, so I have to keep mm. going back and forth. We try to be pretty flexible. Yeah. Um, I I just like to clarify: we are the cultural competence subcommittee. You introduce of, yourself by name for the. Yeah, uh, we will uh, do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we're the Cultural Competence Subcommittee of the Superintendent's Diversity Advisory Committee. Only three of us are going to speak, okay. um, and the rest of the people we wanted you to know who they are. I'm Miriam Stein. I've lived in Arlington for 42 years, and both my children have gone through the Arlington Public Schools. My name is Regina Keynes. I've been in town about 20 years now, and I have a grandson who went to the Audison and graduated from the high school. My name is Pearl Morrison. Um, I lived in Arlington. I've owned a home in Arlington for uh, 42 years. Uh, I have two kids. They've attended the Arlington Public Schools. The TV. My name is Ann Mathis. Um, I just realized I've lived in Arlington for 44 years, <laughs> stating myself, and um, I raised a biracial daughter in the Arlington school system. <laughs> Hi, I'm Barbara Volks. I've been in Arlington almost 24 years now, and two of my grandsons have gone all the way through the, the Arlington schools from the Thompson through the high school. I'm Carmen Pacheco Medeiros. And I've lived in Arlington for 30 years. And uh, I've had grandchildren, nieces and nephews going through the school up to the high school. My name is Alan Schramm, and I've been here for 15 more years. <laughs> Welcome. Young <laughs> The diversity. We want to thank Superintendent Bodie for listening to our concerns and issues. We want to thank the school committee for giving us this opportunity 
to speak here tonight, and we look forward to talking with you at the subgroup. We're here to ask you to set cultural competency as one of the four major district goals for the upcoming year and beyond. The goal we are proposing highlights cultural competency training for administrators, department heads, teachers and staff to be completed within the next two years. We're convinced that it is essential for all adults in the school system to participate. I'll read the goal that we have put forward. It's also in the material on Novus, I guess it's called. The Arlington Public Schools will establish a cultural competency task force to address unconscious bias, coordinate initiatives that are currently underway, which is a really good start, and arrange for and initiate cultural competency training district-wide. The task force will have a part-time coordinator and will be composed of individuals with diverse voices committed to and experienced with cultural competency. The strategic initiatives you can see on your material, it includes having administrators and department heads complete cultural competency training by June 2017, and teachers and other staff complete the training by 2018, as well as increasing the hiring of a diverse workforce. Why are we doing this now? It's not just because of disturbing incidents in our schools and reports of discrimination and disrespect in the schools and the community. Arlington and its schools are not immune from the social climate in our larger society. Some bias is overt. Often teachers don't know how to respond or unco are uncomfortable doing so. Some of our bias is unconscious and we all have biases. We're often not aware of our favorable or unfavorable expectations or assessments of other people based on their characteristics such as race, ethnicity, age, height, appearance, weight, or accent. Our unconscious biases don't necessarily align with our conscious beliefs. All these can affect who gets hired, teachers' expectations for students, or for colleagues for just some examples. Our full proposal that we've given to all of you in paper copies explains the rationale and gives some really, we think, good examples of this. Regina Keynes will tell us a short story of her grandson's teacher who participated in a cultural competency training. As a result, the teacher successfully reframed what have could have been an isolating experience for the young boy into an inclusive teaching moment. Thanks, Miriam. I shared this story with the group and they thought it was uh, fairly relevant to what we're trying to convey to you this evening. Um, the same grandson that graduated from the high school started school in an independent school, a school that has an anti-bias curriculum which may be a close synonym to cultural competency. Uh, he was part of a small group of five boys whose parents allowed them to be kind of the test for the beginning of a first grade. He was the only child of color, the only African-American child. The other children were all Caucasian. One afternoon, um, one of the curious little boys noticed the difference between his hair and my grandson's here. So he went and he touched it, and it was very different from the other boys here. It made my grandson a little uncomfortable, and he may have, for the first time, noticed the difference himself. So the teacher immediately took note, and she said, oh, by the way, Dave, why don't you let, my grandson's name is Chase, why don't you let Chase touch your hair? And 
he did. She says, well, touch one another's hair. Tell me what's different about all the hair that you're touching. And they thought, all right. And she says, well, let's go over to the map on the wall. She said, you know, I need to explain to you why we sometimes, some of us have certain characteristics and some of, others of us don't. And she said, you know, in different parts of the world, nature takes care of us by helping us develop characteristics that make us able to resist some of the elements. And that's why some of us look this way, coming from this part of the world. Others of us look this way. And he said, tomorrow I'm going to bring a microscope to school so you can see what different hair looks like under the microscope. Well, to my grandson, there was never anything I know, because he often would tell me, I'd ask him, what did you do to sc in school today? He'd say, we played. And this was evidence to him of some, a game they had played. So this is just to say that in a school where an anti-bias curriculum is a necessity for every teacher to know, every teacher to understand, may be secondhand to some who have natural instincts towards what to do, but to many of us, including myself, you're not always aware of what to do and what to say unless you've been given the advantage of some kind of training and understanding that helps you. And I think most teachers are very um, positive-minded mind and well-intended, but they don't always know what to do or what to say. Thanks. I'm Exhibit A, right? You're Exhibit A? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Exhibit A uh, because my background is in education. I started teaching in uh, 1960, and I retired in... 2003, um, I've been a classroom teacher of elementary several grades, an assistant principal, and a uh, supervising principal. And what I like about this story is, um, it is true, what it did, what this teacher did was, and what I found that I often had to do as an administrator, and even as a teacher, in the school because I was the only black teacher in the city for well, a long time. And, um, but I found often what I had to do was switch the paradigm so that this was, situations like these were marched from negative aspects of differences to positive, to make it a positive learning experience. I often found that um, my colleagues, and, and, and I also found that the, um, uh, many of our the teachers, and I'm sure my teachers weren't much different from other teachers, found it very uncomfortable to address these cultural differences. First, they were concerned about what their colleagues may think about them. Uh, Secondly, they, even though the word politically correct wasn't uh, uh, that much touted at, at that time, but you know what I mean. They, they uh, didn't feel as it would be politically correct to bring discussions of race and differences. And then I, and then I think some of them just thought that, um, well, you know, if they shared this uh, uh, conversation, uh, that some of their language may be too strong and discursive and uh, cause people to think that they, were, um, that they were prejudiced. So even though it's difficult for, for educators to discuss this cultural, these cultural differences, it's something that I think at this point in time is probably one of the most important um, issues and projects that education has to face. And I think it, the community and the school community, when they decide to take this on collectively and to understand how uh, some of these racial relations and some racial issues, how they actually uh, intimate to students. When that understanding happens, 
than I have found uh, as an administrator in particular and as a parent that uh, in Arlington, I have found that there, there is growth and there is a, a, vi there's a vital growth, there's vitality and, uh, for both the educators and the students. So I think this is the, uh, our responsibility, the Arlington Public Schools, is our responsibility to immediately um, address this cultural competency as uh, one of the four major SMART goals in the district. We'd be happy to answer any questions or discuss any issues. Great, thank you. Um, questions, comments? Yes, Mr. So my question is, uh, what is the cost of the uh, program? And I don't know if um, anyone from the administration can kind of talk about how we might go about implementing that or you know, what kind of work would be required for that. Dr. Brady, have you looked into that? Well, I'm not sure which program they're suggesting. Um, we have um, <coughs> offered this year EMI, which is a, a training, which is, which is multiple sessions. We, we all, when I say we all, the administrators have been working on district goals, recognize that um, this is a time, not that we haven't been offering, but having more, more emphasis on cultural proficiency. Um, what those specific programs are going to be is something that um, is being discussed right now, in fact. So yes, we, we think that that's very important. Now, there is a task force that we are, we're being, that there's a planning task force that is looking at social emotional <coughs> culture of schools and this is certainly a very important part of that that is being funded by AEF and that work is happening this summer. But we, we specifically pulled the cultural proficiency out of it because we do think that that mm -hmm. require, it's important to have that called out. So the answer is what is the cost, I don't. If we fit it within our current uh, professional development calendar, it's going to be the cost is if we have speakers for sure, but it's within our, it's within our, within our, our available time. Uh, we, when we offered it outside that time, we paid for the presenter and we, did, we had not a great turnout for it, to be, be perfectly honest. In part, what's going on in schools today is there's a lot of teachers taking, still taking retail. Administrators took retail this year. Um, people are doing a lot of professional de development that is mandated and there's only so much time. Mm -hmm. um, so I can come back to you later and tell you what that's going to look like, but right now what I can say is that it's something that is um, shared among certainly the, um, the, my, the committee, but also among administrators. And is there also a cost, I assume, that not only do we have to train teachers, but we have to purchase some materials and yes. mm -hmm. you know, all, all of that as well. And it's time. You know, we, we have, um, I'm just thinking. Uh, we have for second, at the secondary level, we have three one hour meetings a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at the elementary level, we have, of course, the Tuesday afternoons, which uh, there's, there's not a lot of time in that either. We had the one professional day and, and some time before the start of school. So we don't, we're limited in terms of what was in the, um, our, our, our range of professional development we have control over and have, ma and have ability to mandate. Okay, Mr. Hainer. I, I guess my feeling is the importance of this is to the level if all of a sudden we discovered we had students in our system that were literally physically harming themselves across the grade, we'd have an emergency session, we'd be sitting down finding ways to deal with it. I appreciate the need for money, and there's no question on that. I see this as, as close to that as can be. We, we, as a society, are very reactive. We've had two incidents that I'm aware of. I think there may have been more that have not hit the public thing. We have issues in this town with people 
identifying in the importance of Black Lives Matter and then people tearing those things down. This to me is a very proactive way. I'm not saying cut things out. Uh, I don't want this, from my perspective, I don't want this to be a voluntary thing. I think this should be an integral part. I also appreciate teachers overworked and, and really burdened, but this to me, this concept of this is such an important thing because I can remember as a teacher, some of my biases assuming that if a child was big, they had matured. That's not a fear, that's a bias on my part. Uh, boys weren't as smart as girls in certain areas and vice versa, there's gender bias. I taught in a community that had one black student, he was in the high school, I never saw another one in my life as an educator. We have a lot of students of color and I, I just see the importance of this and I would ask the superintendent to, it, it, it is important for us and we have to decide on the money aspect of this to work with these people, find out what the program is. I don't see it as one or two lectures. I don't see it as reading a book. I see it as an integral part of forcing me to, to identify my biases and, and working with people and finding a way to deal with it. I think that what uh, Regina shared with us, that's a phenomenal way of taking uh, what I would have found very touchy at the beginning and, and making it a very positive aspect. Uh, I, maybe I'm oversensitive to this now because my, I have black kids in my family right now, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't take that. We are basically a white middle class community or upper middle class community. We need to prepare our students and our kids for all this, thank you. Mr. Slickman. We're not all that white, um, <clears throat> but um, certainly we are at this table. Uh, we're a more diverse community than we think, and there's a lot of intermarriage and a lot of mixed families in this community, uh, including mine. Um, in, in Lowell, uh, we're doing courageous conversations with the Institute for Social Change, and this was just mandated, and we are doing this. And the first session was last month, and they showed a film from a WGBH series and it highlighted two things that touched very closely to home. One of which was the systemic housing discrimination following World War II and that black GIs coming home from war did not have the housing opportunities that white GIs did. And that defined wealth in families. It was the cheap homes that uh, GIs bought coming home from World War II that built family wealth. And black folks were deprived of that mm -hmm. on Long Island where I grew up and they were showing this film in places that I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. Not my community, but I'll tell you, before World War II there were, there were more black folks in town than after World War II. The, the, and the laws that were in place in the 1960s that permitted redlining and discrimination were even more stark than my childhood memory had, uh, which defines us for who we are right now and why certain families have more privilege than others. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the Japanese internment, and I married to a Japanese woman, so I mean, I was just flat out on both of these things, and it took me about two days to recover from this. But it, gave, it, it gives an important perspective, it gives a sense of history of not where we are right now, but why we're where we are right now, and why we're facing some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, you know, even in the New York metropolitan area, I, I think that growing up, uh, there, there are gender and racial and ethnic uh, biases that the culture just sort of put into us. And you, you walk around, you're thinking you're trying to be okay, you're trying to treat people as they come to you, and it doesn't always quite work out the way you want, and sometimes we need to be reflective. Uh, the fact that Lowell's doing this and requiring this is, is huge. Uh, mm -hmm. We had an incident in the high school last fall that wasn't right. Uh, it was done out of concern and trying to do the right thing, but it, it, it wasn't and it was interpreted badly by the community and I think they had good cause for it. People of goodwill and 
did the wrong thing. And I think that uh, in, in a community as diverse as this one, uh, we all come from different places and we need this commonality. Mm -hmm. Ms. Starks? Um, I don't want my uh, questions about cost to in any way make anyone think that I don't want this. Yeah. Um, actually, as a teacher, mm -hmm. um, in the Lexington Public Schools where my students are also very diverse, um, I would welcome this as much, um, you know, I know that retail was something that we were all told we had to do, mm -hmm. but having gone through that training, I'm really glad it was there. It brought a, an insight and an information to me as a teacher that I really am glad I have, and it gave me a whole set of tools to help me better reach the students in my classroom who are there for the first year that they are here in our country. And I would like to hear from Ms. Foley, actually, um, if we were to offer some of these things, you know, wh what do you think? I mean, as a teacher, I think I would love this. I would welcome this. Um, and I would think that the Arlington teachers would probably be the same. I mean, we don't, we don't have enough conversations about these kinds of things, and the sea of differences in our classrooms are enormous. And I would love, you know, when, when Regina and I met and she told me that story, I thought, oh, I wish I had had training so that when that happens to me, when that happens in my classroom, that I know how to respond, that I know the right things to say. You know, it's the reason that we practice fire drills. It's so that when it happens, it's automatic and everyone knows what to say and what to do. And I feel like this is exactly the kind of thing that we need. We need to train our teachers to respond to the students in their classrooms and the things that are going to come up. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? Ms. Foley, do you want to? Sure. Of I, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. Yeah, I'm excellent. trying to just um, put, pin them all down. So I, I work in um, third grade currently at Thompson School, and um, we're probably one of the more diverse um, schools, I would venture to say, elementary schools here in Arlington. Um, and it's always been interesting. I've always found it fascinating um, with watching the kids as they begin to realize the differences that they all have um, between them. and. Um, and how they all handle that. And it's an uncomfortable place to be as an educator, as a teacher, especially as a white teacher. Um, but I, I, have, I have allowed it to, I've allowed it to keep going and I've allowed conversations to develop even if I'm uncomfortable with where, the, with where they are because they always come from a place of curiosity mm -hmm. um, with the children talking about each other's hair. Um, I have a little boy who is um, Sikh, so he wears a turban. Um, and he will talk. I remember distinctly um, a good few years ago now, I had a boy in my class who was um, Pakistani and I had another boy who was Indian and they both could not eat um, uh, meat. I think it was anything to do with cows. And they didn't really get along very well, not because of their religions or anything, they just, you know, one liked football, the other one didn't. Um, and, but whenever, they, whenever we had, at that time we were allowed to have candy and stuff in the classroom. I didn't do it very often. Um, but I remember that there were certain things that I would have and, and one boy would always help the other one out by saying, oh, no, 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 you can't have those Starbursts. They have gelatin. You're, you're, you're not allowed, you're, you can't eat that either. Right. And they would kind of watch out for each other on that. I've had, I've witnessed conversations with kids where they start talking about their, they'll do it with me all the time. They'll talk about their skin tone with me and how they're, they're different from me and how they're different from each other. But, these conversations come up, and they're in a place of they're in a place of curiosity. And I think I try to get past my discomfort with it, so that I can allow them to to talk with each other in a way that makes them all feel equal and safe and and okay to discuss these things. But to always be vigilant for the the bias or for some somebody to say something that will put another person down. Um, I can say with a lot of pride that I think we at Thompson do that fairly well. Um, so that brings me, that's my, my feelings on, on this. There's so much more I could share on that, but um, that's my feelings on that. To flip the switch and to talk about where we as teachers are right now, I have to agree with Dr. Bodhi in that at the moment, we are all quite swamped with the demands that we, are, that we have being placed on us um, right now. I can say that as retail and as some of these other demands start to, start to diminish, I think um, where people, to educators in particular in the district are going to be ready to have conversations about 
um, about other things that they also feel passionate and feel like they need to do. Um, that's not to say that I don't think something shouldn't be started on this issue. Um, I 100% agree with that, but in terms of asking that teachers give professional development time to be trained right now, I would have to say that I think a lot of us are kind of at our limit for what we can, we can do at the moment with our time. Yes, Mr. Hanner. Thank you. I just, in the initiatives, okay, I, I just, in the initiatives, in the initiatives, uh, it said by June 17th, administrators, by June 18th for the teachers. So that's two years away for the teachers. Oh, 2018. Okay, I thought you were just saying a day apart. I was like, that's no, 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 that's it, no help. I, don't I just wanted, I, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, where are you going with that? That, that, that may give a, a, that, that gives a little more context right. for that. Yeah, so, that, that would. You. I'm just, I'm just picturing where I know my teachers are right Tomorrow now. Tomorrow morning we'll start. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, no. yeah, you're, you're just gonna, you're gonna actually defeat your purpose by <laughs> yes, trying I to understand. tell people that they, you know, they need to now get trained in this. But I'm sorry, you had. Actually, let me yeah. let me first get oh. uh, the rest of the school committee, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mr. Hillman. So um, I think this is going to be a very good thing. I think what I want to try to understand is how it integrates into the professional development we're doing now. And so I I I want to uh, I think this is something that's got to be discussed in a lot of detail in a subcommittee. And so what I'm trying to <coughs> understand is what's our timeline for approving the goals and when can a subcommittee meet before the we have to approve the goals so when do we have to approve yeah. the goals can someone refresh my memory we should approve it certainly this school year um, I know that once these are out and we be, that um, principals are going to start thinking about their school improvement plans because they want to have a roadmap for the goals for next year so the teachers can think about for, uh, professional development or plans that they might make this summer. And I, I can say that by having a goal around cultural proficiency and having goals around uh, about looking at social emotional cultures of the schools is going to, is going to seep into all of the school improvement plans and is going to uh, perhaps encourage some teachers to be looking at that as well. In fact, I was met with a principal today who definitely is going to have a goal along those lines. So they all are together. And I would say to your specific question, when should you vote? I would, I would like you to vote by June 9th. I think, I think that's sort of the schedule I was thinking of. Yes, yeah. so the, is yes. that the June 9th? That's the first meeting in June? The first meeting in June. June. All right, yeah, so I think that was the schedule that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So as I think some of you know, I ran a school in Dorchester where 94% of the young people were young people of color. So I'm a, a, a proponent of this kind of training. Uh, I just want to kind of know how it's going to fit into the training and the, and the demands we already have on our staff. Um, professional development time is always precious, and we have to make sure that it, this can be done. So I think it needs to be discussed in a subcommittee. And then on June 9th, the first meeting of the of the of June, in June, um, we need to take a vote on the goals, and we've got to figure out, you know, if these, if this, if this can fit in this year, and if these are realistic. So right. I think what we need to do is get this to a subcommittee. The subcommittee needs to meet between now and. Do you want to do a motion now? Oh yeah, I'll just do a motion. Let's, let's, so let's, I. Let's have a motion. So I'm going to move that the uh, all the goals, and in particular the dis, the uh, cultural competency proposal, be uh, uh, sent to the curriculum instruction and assessment subcommittee and that they should meet sometime between now and the end of May. I second that. Okay, so a uh, goal by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Do you want to speak to the, the yeah, motion? I, I, I would, and I apologize, Mr. Schlickman, if I'm putting too much pressure on you, but I'd like to have a report back by the 26th, not to vote on or anything, just so that we can give some, as a body, give input. Uh, if it's done by the end of May, right. we'd, it would be presented and would be voting on that's whatever they're doing. Mr. Slipman, and and I, if, if, as long I as we get possible? the committee to get, subcommittee together, it's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's just a matter of scheduling. Just scheduling. Okay, so so good faith effort. Um, Absolutely. Okay. And we'll put out a doodle tomorrow. I, Excellent. Good faith effort. If I may, 
Uh, just to go along with it, uh, I, I asked Ms. Fitzgerald to give everybody a piece of paper. Uh, it's a chart that I got from MASC on goal alignment. I would ask the subcommittee to look at that. Okay, as well. Well, let's Thank actually you. let's talk about that just a little bit. Let's finish this conversation, and then sure. we'll we'll go to Fine. other issues that we want to send. Uh, though I think I think we have to vote on this first, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so as I understand the motion, the motion is not just to send. Uh, the cultural competency proposal, but also well, we're sending all the district goals, goals yeah. Yeah. Um, as well. Um, I guess we could do. You want to, do you want to amend it to send this thing? I just want them why don't we, why don't we do that? to look at okay. it and consider okay. it. Let's, let's amend we it. We can so have that's it with we, us. You know. We also send. Okay. We'll, we'll so um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Um, any opposition? Okay. Um, well, no, yes, Dr. Reddy. I'm not opposing it. I think <laughs> it's a great idea. But well, I think, I, I, I think it would be a, a good idea just to just have an, an overview tonight of these goals. Yes, because we're you've had a chance to read it. Okay. Right. Yeah. But I think, we're that, that. We'll I think let's, let's, let's go back to, um, to you guys and uh, for any comments. Mm -hmm. uh, just a very quick one yes, that absolutely. I want, wanted to mention in line with the uh, comment about how you're o overextended right now, especially teachers. Um, I, I'd strongly promote that in the meantime mm -hmm. that the administrative staff become acclimated with mm -hmm. this. I, I worked in the corporate world and in the higher ed world, and this doesn't really take if the people in leadership mm -hmm. aren't already well imbued with the ideas and the concepts, then it almost becomes mm -hmm. an automatic practice. Mm -hmm. It's what people begin to hear. It's how you address certain things. So I would suggest, and I don't know what the timetables are in terms of how administrative staff um, could begin a, an um, indoctrination along the lines. And interestingly enough, there are programs out there that are relatively integrative that because what you do, if you take people out separate <coughs> from the environment in which they um, work, it doesn't happen as easily or as quickly sometimes. And, very, and there are programs out there where, interestingly enough, the uh, education can be a part of what you're doing anyway every day in the process of doing what you do. Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't, now there may be some needs for work outside that would take some time, whether it's inde independent time or time out of the framework of the school day. But there are certain programs out there where the kind of education is done in sync with what you are already doing so that it doesn't look like I have to take time out to do it. Because when you take time out to do it, often it doesn't get back in mm -hmm. because of all the other things. So if in the interim there was some way and uh, Dr. Bode, you, when I heard about what was happening in um, terms of the task force or these, um, these um, consultants. Con focus. consultants and focus groups, et cetera, yeah. I turned to everybody and said, they started. <laughs> I mean, you're yeah. really on your way to doing some of this, and you're already fitting it in. Yeah. So my sense was with some support and help, what you're already doing could be mounded, uh, rounded into what this could eventually blossom as an integrative process that's already happening and that just becomes nurtured and um, uh, further developed. And we would be happy to give you some names of organizations that do this kind of work. Great, thank you. Th thank you very, very much for your time. I, I, excuse me. I'd also be interested in knowing, um, we, we know there's some focus groups that were formed and people brought in to talk with them and, and be interesting to know what their feedback was. Um, okay, so I actually, I think we, we have to move on, but I, I have to say that I appreciate your time and effort and coming to speak to us about this. Um, I did a three-hour program in college once that was transformative um, where I, you know, really I came from a background in high school where I wasn't supposed to notice differences and, you know, and, and, and then sort of opened my eyes and realized, oh, wait, <laughs> if it's all done positive and respectful, it's okay to talk about differences. And, and it was really transformative. Um, so thank you for uh, your continual attention to this. Um, actually, I have one question for Dr. Wadi before finishing this. Um, 
their proposal, as I understand it, is for administrators first. How many administrators would that apply to? Do, do we, what would be our guess? How many people would that be? Well, it'd probably be about 36. 36, okay, okay, so. Okay, so uh, details, obviously, devil's in the details, so, and those are to be worked out at subcommittee, um, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank Thanks. you very thank much. You. Thank you. Mr. Dr. Bode, yeah. at, at some future meeting, would you report back to us the program that you've already started? It doesn't have to be now. Yeah, I will. Fine, I, yeah, thank this, you. This, okay, thank you. Well, we, well, we maybe mm -hmm. put an agenda on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so the there next are questions on goals. Are so we we need to, see, yeah, uh, we're going to actually talk about an overview on the goals. We're, yeah. we're going to talk about the goals mm -hmm. now, and I think um, ask Dr. Bodhi to talk about the goals that are there, but also the process that you went through. Yes, informing it would mm -hmm. be great. Mm -hmm. The process um, for developing district goals um, really co comes out of you know, the experience we've had before. I mean, where we, we do a reflective process and where we are um, as a district and where we see needs that need to be met. And this process be, um, certainly has some roots with teachers. Um, I would like, in fact, it's one of the things I would like to have a little bit more formal process about is having teachers involved in it. But at the department level, these discussions happen, and at the school level, they do too. Um, we began looking at really what our wh what is our vision, um, <coughs> what are we, do we see as obstacles, and um, in the past we have really tried to look at some very specific things. You know, we want to achieve this SGP or or very specific numbers. But I would have to say that one of the things that came out this year in our process is that I think we're at, we're doing a lot of really effective and good things in the school district and we're seeing the results of it. Um, but I think there's a collective feeling that this is a, a special time right now to sort of have a reflective time. And that's actually even part of a macro kind of goal setting is that you do, you, you make proposals, you do the work, you see what the results are, and then you have reflection. And I think, I think at, a, at a very large level, that's exactly where we are right now in really wanting to take a look at where we are and develop some action plans for the, for the future in some very important areas. Um, the first goal, um, that we've identified. This, first of all, for people who are listening, there are four overarching goals of the school district that were developed um, in conjunction with teachers, administrators, and school committee a number of years ago. And uh, they, 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 uh, they embody what the vision of the, of the school district is in terms of what we want to, for all of our students. And to that, to that end, every year we look at how we're going to further that, what are the strategic initiatives, or we want to call them strategic goals of the next year that is going to ha improve student achievement. So the first goal is about student achievement. What, is, what, what, is, what do we need to do? Now, as you know, over the last uh, many years, uh, we have spent quite a bit of time as a school district aligning our curriculum to the common, to the, the Massachusetts uh, common core frameworks. And um, I think that we've done a very good job of doing that. But one of the things that's still true about uh, common core, for that matter, the next generation science standards, um, or even in, in any discipline, is that there's a lot. There's a lot. And while the common core did, did a, I, a much better job than we had with the previous standards of of really calling out what are the really important benchmarks, uh, learning benchmarks in, in, in math and ELA and science to some extent. Um, I think that what we're finding, and this is, comes from uh, conversations with teachers, is we really need to be able to identify what are the really key learnings that st all students um, uh, should master at the, at a, in a, in a, at each grade level, in each content area, and certainly at the secondary level in each course. 
And this is a very uh, time consuming process. To some extent, we've already begun, but we haven't really said, okay, it's time. And, and one of the things that Dr. Chesson's working on with curriculum leaders is, is being able to uh, put a lot of our curriculum documents um, on our website, and that's a process that's in play right now. And these would be added at, at a different time. So we're going to be doing this work um, because we think it's important. And it's important because we want to know what is really key for all students to master in a given year. And um, there's gonna be a lot of things we're gonna have as well, but that focus is going to be important. The other, uh, going on to another initiative we want next year is that and this is really a high school goal primarily. Um, now that we are moving forward in the MSBA process, um, what is important to MSBA and key in terms of any plans for the school is that we can articulate very clearly what is our vision. How does that vision look in terms of courses we offer, the spaces we would use, the adjacency of programs, um, whether we're gonna, we need more space for projects, maker spaces. It's, it's a philosophy. And while I think that that exists, I know that it exists, I, I think that uh, it's something that we need to refine, define mm -hmm. more, spend really some, some deep mm -hmm. thinking time this year in getting clarity on this. And I'm gonna invite you all into that process as we go through this. But, and, and, the, and the principal of the high school is, he and I have been talking about this for months now and, and, and actually the truth is we've been talking to the high school staff for the last 18 months or two years on this. But now we're gonna to have to move into a higher gear and at the end of that time have a very clearly articulated vision uh, so that that becomes the basis for what we do. And at that meeting, and I'm sure I'm gonna hear it again when we go to the MSBA, when we get invited to commence the process, um, that that's what they wanna see. They, and and, and when, they, when you propose something to the building, they wanna see direct link between that proposal and your philosophy and your vision. Um, so that is a huge task this year. Okay, I think we may be a little ambitious, but we were, we were in the, what do we want? Yeah, yeah. We're very ambitious about right. what we want to do. Everything on goal one, and then All we'll right. take, we'll, okay. Sorry, and then we'll go through. Right. Okay. Um, again, it's like trying to get our, to get us, uh, <coughs> our arms around um, our, a student support, our student support team process, which has, um, has different models in different schools. And what we, we think is important is first of all, find out where we are with all of that. Um, and schools are in different places. I know that one school has already done a lot of work on this in terms of the forums and how they use SST, who's at those meetings, how it relates to RTI, which is response to intervention. In other words, how does it relate to the interventions that are done? How does that relate to um, then the next step, perhaps referrals to special ed. So it's a it's a, an assessment year, um, and trying to get um, some common common processes in place. Okay. Some people think that goal this goal here really relates to the next one, and it does. Except that except that a number of us felt it was important to really be specific about it because what this is, this probably will have more um, actions that will be put into place right away next year. Whereas the next goal, which is one that we've talked to you about before, and that is we want to look at all of the different ways, it's an assessment of where we are as a district in promoting uh, social emotional um, competency, uh, promoting positive school cultures, and all the discussion we've had before certainly relates to all of this. And um, 
a number of people um, led by uh, Allison Elmer, who, by the way, had her baby this <gasps> week. Oh, mm. oh, oh that's no great. Way. Wow. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah. Yes. Name? We have Rafe. Name? Rafe. Oh, nice. Nice. Rafe. Nice. Uh huh. She says it, it, it rhymes with safe. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry we've been so crazy with things going on. I meant to get you an email out on that, but we're all very happy everything went well. Okay. Oh, good. So at any rate, uh, a, a, grant a grant proposal was sent to AEF, and this is a major grant for them in helping us to a planning grant means that it, it provides the stipends that are necessary for the work that will be done outside, and, and a lot of the work will be done in the summer in assessing all of this, and, and there's a lot going on. Um, and then the, then the issue is, to what extent should we be doing the same thing um, at all different levels? And th that'll be the next phase of it. So, next, so right now, this is a, a more of an assessment part of it. And before we go into questions, I don't know if, if um, Laura wants to, Dr. Chesson wants to add anything on to that particular one? To the last one? Mm -hmm. um, no, I think that um, as we touched upon with the other uh, group was here, um, that we're looking at all things that contribute to student success mm -hmm. and really um, what would take to have teachers um, have a true growth mindset for every student. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions, comments? Mr. Hainer. I, I've asked for and I, I guess I'm the only one, or maybe. These are not smart goals. There, there's no, uh, in the one, two, the, the terms core values, identified essential habits of the mind, refined vision and programs. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are statements, I understand them, how do you measure them? And, mm -hmm. and I'm not asking for an answer right now, mm -hmm. but um, we talk about establishing committees. Uh, there should be a date, who they are going to report to, what the parameters are. The, to me, I think it's very important to have SMART goals that show when and how they're going to be attained. And they may not be. There may be reasons they're not going to be. The first one, uh, one, one says a two-year timeline. Uh, I understand that. And that, that it says identify essential learning standards. and program. That one is fine. But I thought we're coming to the end of the second year of this one already, aren't we? Or are we? For what? For one one, identify the essential learning standards and progressions by discipline at all levels, align the curriculum instruction. I thought I've read this two years in a row now. Mm -mm. I think the difference this year is that we have, while we have aligned, as Dr. Bodhi um, described, as we have aligned our curriculum to the, <coughs> the Common Core standards, what we have, we're hearing loud and clear from teachers is that we need to identify those power standards. And the committee has asked, and we have been begun to work on this year, developing a vision so what does it look like the kids are going to look like when they walk out the door and how do we roll that vision back and how what are the power standards that uh, are okay then with that? i guess in the goal whether it's a hyperlink or something expand these and and with dates and times for completion i'm not i i as one i'm not going to hold you to that date but a, a realistic date for where it is when we talk about setting up committees who are going to be on these committees and who are they reporting to and when are the expectation of reporting to so, can I make, can I make a comment yeah, Dr. I think that um, you know you're you're absolutely correct that we need to have that those specificities I'm not sure that this is the place to write them because what, what what I think we need to have is a separate document that has the goals that talks about what the actions are who's on the, who's responsible what the timeline is What's the product that you want to see at the end? Um, I guess we, we spent several uh, meetings on d developing SMART goals and working on it. The, the initial goal that we had, the, uh, Mr. Thielman worked very, very hard crafting it and finally came out. We came to a consensus on this. And, and uh, the, uh, is it Ms. Walla? Walla? Yeah, Nancy Walla. She pushed us, kept pushing us to develop SMART goals. We, with specific things on it, we're not having them here. And I guess the the spec. I'm not looking for the granular specificity, but we need to have. It has to be published. And if you're talking about adding that specificity, put a hyperlink to it. 
so that we, get, we, we can do it and the public can look at it too. So that's I just, fine. I just want to throw out that this is exactly the kind of thing that the subcommittee should be really discussing. Fine. This is really, this fine. is the kind of discussion we really do need, want fine. to have. Um, and the thought was the subcommittee would and have a sort of then, greater freedom to right. talk about this exact this, this is why I would like us to come back prior to the 9th of June. Yeah, great idea. In fact, in fact, actually, can I throw out? And I'll back off. We might decide as a committee that we want to have a retreat around, around these. We might decide we don't. But that, that should come out in the next couple of weeks, you. hopefully. Uh, Mr. Salmon. So I, what I'd be interested, I'm not, I don't know if the school committee needs to know, uh, you know who's doing what inside the district and each of the goals. But I do think it, we need these goals and then just the measure. That would be a good thing to have for the next subcommittee. Meeting. What you know? What are the suggestions? What are the? Is that possible? Is that realistic? I mean, just so the measures are. I mean, identify the learning uh, essential learning standards and progressions by discipline at all levels and align curriculum, which is a big thing. It's a lot to do. Would be you know, um, you know, I imagine we're going to get the measure is a report on the standards that are identified. I mean, right? Is that yeah? You will you will have those documents. Yeah. Most of these are going to be documents. Yeah, yeah that so, you're going to get reports on. Yeah. So some of it's self-explanatory, but I just I would say sort of I, some here yes. add in the in the next meeting just measure colon what they are. So that's that's how I would suggest doing that. Mr. Carton. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, it's kind of like you know IEP goals that you have the goal and then you have the measurement. There should be mm -hmm. you know something we can we can look at to say 10 learning strategies were developed or mm -hmm. uh, the committee met 10 times you know but there should be some goal about how many times the committee is going to meet or how many you know what it is we're measuring but I you know I do want to I do want to add one point Th these are these are powerful goals I mean I think what we're talking about here in, in goal one is potentially uh, you know, has a huge impact on the district. I, I, identifying standards, um, refining the educational vision and programs of the high school, uh, student support, establishing a committee to assess the student support model, um, and a committee to, to assess the uh, district strengths and challenges in creating safe and supportive school environments. These are all big things. So um, I applaud the superintendent and her staff for, you know, identifying some big goals that are going to have a big are going to have a significant impact on teaching and learning in the district. These these goals here, the, the over, overarching goals, they will then bear down into the superintendent's goals, then the administrative goals, then the teaching goals. Right. So the the clarity in here is very very important for each subsequent group to understand, so that they're in uh, aligned for the student uh, achievement. That, that I, I guess. I agree with you. These are the overarching ones. They're very broad, but they're big too. They're impactful. That's what, that's my point. They're impactful. Yeah. I just want them to be clear so that each subsequent group understands them. That's all. And as you say, goes to the. So what I yeah, what I think is that CIA has a lot of work in front of yes. them, mm -hmm. <laughs> both in terms of the clarity and in terms of the the format, what things are going to look like, whether smart goals going to be incorporated or a separate document. I mean, this is seems like CIA should make a recommendation to us. But yes. I mean, the, 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 the four goals are the overarching goals. And so we're layering it down so that a, a, a broad sub-goal here without a, lot of specific, without a lot of specificity at this level, but with more specific, specific specificity, better word than that, <laughs> it's tough to say. Specific. Details, more details, details, details. details. Yeah. More detail. <laughs> As, as it's layered down, so the superintendent's goal would have be be more the format for the SMART goal, where you're seeing what they will do under this, and a principal who is impacted by this will, will have the action steps and the expected outcomes. So something at this level, I wouldn't expect to have that, but the next level down, where you've got individual administrators coming up with how they will implement this, there should be sort of a broad group of specific goals, mm -hmm. smart goals, so to speak, that, that have uh, outcomes and action steps in them. Uh, not at this level. That's just my viewpoint. Okay. Great. Um, any more discussion on the first one before we go on to discussion? Yes, Mr. Hainer. I guess not to take anything away from Dr. Bodie, do we need to go 
to hear every single thing on the remaining goals? Uh, well, I am cognizant of that as soon as I got back, we stopped being fast, right? <laughs> the now, now it's taking a lot longer. Well, so it yeah, must be you me. I mean, it's clearly you, it's me. You and I have helped. <laughs> um, so goal one is certainly very important. I do think it's worth going through the other goals. The other goals are shorter. I go through all the goals. But, yeah, um, let's, go but I will, let's go. Yeah, so I'll anything else on quickly. goal one before we move on to goal two? No. No. Okay. The others, Goal two. The, the others are much more, I mean, we can put them in smart goals because they're much more concrete, mm -hmm. do this. This, the goal one here, this work is going to, I could not agree with you more, it's going to be very impactful in this district. Very. Okay. So, you know, we're looking at professional development for the new science curriculum and math curriculum. Science is um, grades four and five, math K1. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at professional development for cult cultural competency, and um, we'll be thinking about how that is going to look. Um, we're not there yet, though we have been doing some work on this issue. It's, this is not something like we're, we're going from nothing to something. Provide uh, on re uh, regular ongoing professional development and technology. This is a actually a goal that comes from the teachers, it comes from my advisory committee. Uh, they very much want that. We have done this uh, and they want it to continue. So that is the goal in professional development. Could I uh, just yeah. real quick, on the last one there, is that at all grade levels? Yes. Okay. I, I, it says in their classrooms. I, I just wanted all the teachers. Thank you. Okay. We can clarify that too in wording you. if you want. So the, the, the next goal, goal, goal three. Two. Wait, actually, oh, okay. actually, let's, yeah, let's, let's continue. Are we done with goal two? We're going to, okay, so let's discuss goal two. Yes, Ms. Starks. So I think that four dash two needs to move up into this one. It's about the diversity of staff, which is explicitly stated in yep. the overarching goal. Yep. Four two needs to move up and become two four. It should be two yeah, four, not four two. Yeah, that's nice. It just, <laughs> <laughs> just flip them. Yep. Any more comments? Yep. Goal four, the overarching, is about the operations, not the diversity. Okay. Not diversity. Okay. I've lost it on my iPad. Um, or to, to develop a diverse staff. Okay, anything else about goal two? I have my goals. No, nope, that was my only. Yes, yes, so the cultural competency goal is, so I'm just trying to understand that the group's not here anymore. Yeah. Are they asking for a separate goal or is it kind of already represented by two? They were asking for they were a asking for it separate to overarching goal. Uh, uh, no. Yes. So it feels like they're asking for specificity, specificity here, that it would fit it. it would fit here. Yeah. So it fits but in 2-2, two, two, but it more specific. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we... Great. They want it as on, ongoing, not just a one-time yeah. thing. So they want to move this yeah. right up to the top. They yeah, I mean, they, they wanted it as a, one of the four overarching goals, but maybe they misunderstood. <coughs> so far, yeah, right, right. This um, one right But I think specificity hmm. would satisfy Build the capacity. Mm -hmm. the yeah. yeah, okay. So that's about uh, anything else on goal two? Okay, uh, goal three. Goal, goal three is about the resources, infrastructure, and educational environment in Arlington Public Schools. We have a lot going on next year. We have the Stratton Project. Hopefully we will have the Thompson Project moving forward. Um, we hopefully will have the Gibbs project, which probably should put in there, uh, which it didn't because we didn't have the votes at that point. And um, we have a multi-year technology plan, so I want to put it in there is just to acknowledge the fact that we are moving forward on that. And then, which will be very time consuming, and as though none of these are, <laughs> um, is, is completing the modules for the MSBA process for the high school. Um, so that's Could I just be yeah, a uh, building uh, emphasis. Hold on. Let's, let's just I thought she said she was finished. I'm sorry. Oh, are, you, are you finished? Oh, yeah. uh, yes, just sure. for clarification, facilities starting next year is not our province anymore? It's still in our it'll still be in our budget but the budget itself is going to be managed by Ruthie Bennett it will still reside in our budget I thought that was just for a two year period until she's consolidating the town facilities budget 
in FY17, and then 18, the school piece of it is migrating over to her. Okay. But for next, for this upcoming year, she's going to be, we, we've defined facilities very clearly. It's a subsection of our budget. She's going to manage that portion of the budget, and I'm just going to keep an eye on her to make sure she doesn't spill over her boundaries. Will we still be, if there's a need, uh, facilities, uh, water damage and stuff like that, if it's, we, if it's drastic stuff, we would handle it the way we would now. We would go to town, you know, okay. for self-insurance money or anything like that. If we have another elevator-type incident, that's going to have to stay within the parameters of her budget. She's going to have okay. to cut something else the within re, facilities. The, the reason I made that assumption is there was a debate the other night on the salary and that the now salary said... Oh, let's not He didn't understand. Right. He Let just didn't be. understand. That was crazy. All right, anything else on? Yes. Yes. Um, I think that um, under this goal, actually, one of the things I'd really like to see is I think that we need to uh, create two five to ten year plans. One, I want to see a maintenance plan for the schools that is through this new department and Dr. Bodie. I know that they know what they're going to do, but I want to see it on paper. I want to see what the, the maintenance plan mm -hmm. is, and I think that that needs to be a goal. Mm -hmm. And I also think we need a five-year plan or a 10-year plan that literally school by school talks to what we are going to do about enrollment in every school because, again, I know that we have all this information, but it's not out there anywhere where anybody can follow it and understand it. We're like changing this school and doing this school and doing that and doing that, and I understand that, but it's not written down anywhere. There is no plan. There's nowhere that says, ah, in the year 2018, we will be in this position of, you know, handling the Audison, and we're handling the enrollment problem in 2018 at Dallin by doing this, or you know, like I want to see how we're responding school by school to these enrollment numbers. And I know that we have that information. I'm not saying that it's not being done, but I don't feel like we have it written down anywhere and organized in a way that other people can follow it. And the school enrollment task force, the you know, uh, permanent town building, the town manager would all really could really use something mm -hmm. like this is just our thinking mm -hmm. put down on paper so just as a clarification i mean we could do that in several different ways um one would be to ask for a report or something um but you'd like to put this in the goal section i would like it okay. to be a goal so that, that we create these be two sent planning documents to the, i mean i actually frankly i plan to attending the subcommittee that should be sent to the subcommittee mm -hmm. i think uh, yes mr Schlickman. I, I think that uh, ms starks has a very valid argument because we had a town meeting member get up last mm -hmm. night and say, how come we don't maintain our facilities? And we do. And I think that to have the documentation there and said, we do maintain our facilities and this is what we do, okay. and this is our long range plan would okay. be an important thing in, in terms of helping us to build confidence in the community on our ability to, to take care of the facilities that we have. Well, actually then I, I have a clarificatory question. Um, now that we're no longer in charge of the facilities is it's really our purview well I mean I think when it when we're talking about enrollment and school utilization that's yes, absolutely that's our purview. Our purview. But, I mean, but in terms but of in maintenance term, well you know in terms I mean there you're absolutely right that everything exists in a very scattered way and I think you know in terms of writing an overarching report that merely pulls the existing information together mm -hmm. that that's probably something that would be under my purview and I'd certainly work with the facilities director okay. now that's not going to get into the granularity of you know this this boiler is going to have its filters changed on. Right, right, right. No, oh. right. no right. we're talking oh. big picture. Yeah, 10, big picture. So you, so you still see this as something that that is part of the school administration. Oh yeah, sort of. I mean it's going to have to be an ongoing conversation right. okay. in terms of how okay. we're going to move this, and it also intersects with the capital budget committee. Right. And yep. the five-year planning of yep. capital budget. Exactly. So this is. Yeah, we sounds, sort of, you know, yeah we, I mean we, this we, is. Yeah. We would need to define a common understanding yep. with the f new facilities director, who I'm sure wants to do the best for us to, as well. But yeah. to have have this clearly communicated back and forth, so we know what's happening, and that in the town, people of the town can look in and see and see this. I mean, the question was, I mean, she, our, the facilities director made a very valid point about having incorporated into the software a schedule where a ticket would go in for maintenance on an item when it is due so that it would automatically be done. So now we've got this package and the software is doing it. All we need is a 
master report saying, okay, this is our maintenance schedule and what was programmed into this new device. Well, that sounds something different than what Starks was asking for. Well, it, it's along the same lines. Well, I think she know. was asking, I think there was two, yeah. two requests really. But um, actually, I just, I have a question for the committee, which is, do we want to send this as is to the CIA, um, yes. or do we want yeah. to ask the administration to do more work before it gets there? Is that, well, oh, any thoughts in there? Yeah, Mr. Hayman. They don't, the uh, CIA has not got a date yet, so if Dr. Bodhi wanted to make adjustments to this, make it, make I, it, I see no problem be, with that. There could be from this but, discussion. But I, would, I wouldn't okay. want the CIA to be just constantly waiting yeah, for yeah, updates yeah, yeah, yeah. and updates like that. I, I assume Dr. Bodhi, yeah. I, I won't okay. assume you're coming. Put a doodle Mr. Yeah. Well, I think this is the first conversation about it. Dr. Yeah. Bodhi takes the mm -hmm. conversation back. She edits it. Mm -hmm. We asked for some measures. She kind of prepares the document with some measures, and that's what the, that's what that's the, what the committee okay. talks about. Yeah. Great. Okay. I to get a sense of that. Um, anything else on goal three? Nope. Okay. Uh, goal four. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, okay. Goal four is re regarding operations, communication, and stakeholder engagement. Um, well, the, as you can see, the first goal is a continuation of one we had last year which we made some progress on, which is the completion of a dashboard of district metrics. And the purpose of this is to provide the community with a quick overview of some of the key metrics that, that, uh, about the, the school department. And the community relations um, did, did some, saw it and made some suggestions. We're sort of limited by the, the limits of the technology of our current website. but. Having said that, I think there's a lot we still could do and love to get that finished. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the, already the diversity of the AP, uh, APS staff. What we're looking to see is that we're going to increase the diversity from our current levels of staffing. And this was a goal last year. In fact, I think it's been a goal for a couple of years and, um, and one that we revisit every year when we do hiring with, with our uh, administrators. And then um, uh, the, this one, uh, uh, Ms. Johnson wants in here because this is actually going to be quite uh, impactful too in terms of uh, the workings of the business office in implementing upgrades to our financial system. Um, and we need to provide, of course, professional development to all the users so that we really can create some more efficiency in the operations. And I don't know if you'd like to speak a little bit more to that particular goal, or they have questions. Yeah. Other questions? No. Sounds so, fabulous. Uh, yeah, so things on goal four. Yes, Mr. Mm -hmm. Um This may not be the year to do it because this, this financial software going in as well, but it, they and you talked about at the subcommittee meeting looking at future years, and I, and I do think it would be helpful for communication with the rest of the town decision makers to have a multi-year budget roadmap. I mean, we kind of know we're going to need to add a teacher at the Thompson every year for the next three years until it's fully staffed up. We're going to need to add a teacher at the Hardy based on the McKibben projections every year for the next four years, whatever it is. We're going to add a cluster, half a cluster here and a half a cluster there. So we sort of know where we're going with a lot of the staffing decisions based on enrollment numbers. And if we had those numbers, you know, in a, in a three or four year document, I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. We've always done it the other way. We've had a multi-year document based on the long range plan and taking the money and basically showing what we have to work with with money get based on our current staffing levels. And we usually do that in the fall after our summer hiring settle down and we know what our, what our teacher salary load looks like starting into the fall. If we were to do it the way you suggest, I think it's probable that you're going to have two very different numbers that you're looking at, and it might be somewhat inflammatory. So nice to see. I think we have to do it, though. I, I think. Yeah, Mr. Hainer. I, I think it. I think it would be a document document for us to look at. If somebody asked to see it, they they could see it. But I I think it might be helpful in our projections going forward. Actually, I have something to add. I, I, um, you know, this is a particularly a goal about um, communication, stakeholder engagement, and I think we have a bunch of projects going on, and that we need to sort of develop um, 
big picture overview of how to reach out to the community, how to reach out to teachers, um, how to solicit input as we make these very expensive and, and important decisions that we need to really have a sense of for the Gibbs, for the Thompson, you know, what kind of committees are going to be involved? How, what's the timeline? Um, what kind of public outreach is going to go on? And I'd like to see a better sense of that in, in our goals. The high school, everything. <laughs> we have a lot going on. We have a lot going on, and the more people who are part of the conversation, not, not the part of the decision, but part of the conversation, mm -hmm. um, the better this is going to go for our community. Because it's a lot of money that the community is putting up, mm -hmm. potentially. Okay. Yeah. I, in fact, I just had conversations along these lines with a um, representative to Vision 2020 in thinking about at what stages along the way are we going to have um, ways that we, we hear parent voice and mm -hmm. community voices in some of these because it's important mm -hmm. that they do have um, an opportunity to, to weigh in. And we did that with Stratton, mm -hmm. and I expect that we will do that. In fact, I know we will do that with all the projects facing us. The high school one, um, everyone is thinking about the high school and what it's going to look like. And, and so there has to be opportunities for people to have input. Yeah. yeah. And I would just say, actually, it's not just parents. It's, it's teachers as well. And I know that this happens, but it should be part, explicitly part of our goals that it, we're doing outreach to teachers. It's you know, definitely going to be involved with, yeah. with yeah. teachers, yes. Absolutely. Mr. Hainer, did you? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Just I got you. holding my head up. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments, questions about? Nope. Okay. So are we looking? This is it. We've done everything else. Everything's we been covered. We haven't done the superintendent's report. Superintendent's oh, report. Yes. Okay. Great. Dr. Reddy. I have a question. Really? Oh. Not much. Um, I, I just want to congratulate the teachers and students at Audison for an outstanding Annie performance. They, it was fantastic. But then on the same weekend, we had the pops which is also amazing when you hear our high school students, um, how they, the, their level of um, performance and, and, and mastery of music is, is so impressive. So we are very fortunate that we have the teachers that we have that um, give their time to this because um, much of this is really is time that they give because they love doing what they're doing. And um, so I want to thank them for that. And the last thing is that the um, encourage people to take a look at the uh, April newsletter because it's one of our longest ones and there is a lot going on in the school district. Uh, it's a great way for people to really get um, an overview of things that we don't talk about here at the table and um, there wouldn't be time to look at as, as tonight goes. But it's a good way of seeing what's happening in all of our schools. And that is on the website right now. Great. Ms. Starks. Um, I had a question about um, drinking water. Um, with all the news, all the uh, stuff mm -hmm. going on about drinking water, yep. I know that um, they have, the state has released funds, um, although it's a pittance and sure it won't cover half of what needs to happen. Um, but I wonder if <clears throat> we can get a report on the water quality in our schools or at least some information on how often we test. Yep. Are we gonna to try to go after some of that money? Yep, uh, we are. We're definitely going after some of that money. It's being led by the, the efforts by the health department. Um, and yes, we have identified where we want to test the water. Some waters have been tested. In fact, um, interestingly, I learned from the town manager that Leslie Ellis did a, um, a test at the Gibbs last year and the water was Fine. Okay. Now, I don't know what fine means, <laughs> and I haven't seen the report, but I am quite certain that there was a, probably a, a full array in testing. So yes, we are doing that. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely also correct that the money that the state's allocated is a drop in the bucket. And I can tell you that other towns have jumped on this yeah. right away. So we're, we're scrambling to get our application in. Do, do we accept by the end of the year? We'll, we'll have a better sense. We'll have done the testing? I don't know. I, I don't know when they're going to give the awards out. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I, I also Start have here. another question. Um, it, I saw in the notes that um, there was an announcement about a meeting with the state reps about the state budget on Monday. 
Does anybody know more about that or where it is and when it is? Mm -mm. Clarissa made the announcement at town meeting last night. I thought oh, it said. Oh, I don't. I didn't hear anything about it. I thought I saw that um, okay. my, this Monday. I no. thought it was this Monday. I didn't Past no Monday or coming up. The one coming up. I can ask. We'll go back. Okay. Yeah. No one has heard about it. Okay. okay. I didn't know. Maybe that was. Yes, Mr. Hannon. Motion to adjourn. Yes. <laughs> Second. Seconded a motion to adjourn by uh, Mr. Hayner, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that's an affirmative vote.